Hi everyone, our program will start at exactly 6.30 p.m. Thank you.
Good evening from Manila, Philippines. Good morning in New York and London. And to the rest of our participants, good day. Let us begin our program with a prayer to be led by Father Pacifico Misaho. Let us put ourselves into the most holy presence of our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we praise and worship you as our one and only God. We give you thanks with all our hearts and minds for all the graces you have bestowed upon us unconditionally. Despite our lowliness and being undeserved by such holy blessings, we are still kneeling before you, before your loving presence, to ask your forgiveness and mercy. This evening, we, your beloved children, are gathered together in this webinar to learn the knowledge and truth inscribed in the thoughts and words of your daughters, Henry Conrad Marchus, Hannah Arendt, and Santa Teresa Benedicta of the Cross. As we humbly, we are humbly asking your Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds and invigorate our psyche so that we can truly grasp and receive what you wish to teach us through the persons of Professor Rando, Professor Ruby, and Father Francis. Bless them, O Lord, with the necessary blessings they need in their life. Bless also, O oh God, those who are all present here, our invited participants, the organizers, the University of Santo Tomas Philosophy Department, and the UST Graduate School and the Varsitari. As we embark on honing and nurturing our gift of intelligence through this webinar, may we in return give back all the glory and honor which you most deserve. As Santa Teresa Benedicta of the Cross prayed, my soul serves him at every hour. All my riches I have consigned to him. No longer do I tend the flock. No office more belongs to me. One thing alone I do, and that is to love you. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father Pasi. Before we open our program, let us remind ourselves of our house rules for tonight's webinar. First, please set your Zoom name according to the following format, first name and surname, and then your country, current country you're residing in. And just to remind everyone, limited slots are available for this webinar, so you are encouraged to secure your slot by staying until the end of the session. Respect and professionalism are expected to be observed. We are video and audio recording this webinar. There is also a live stream via Facebook Live. Putting your camera on during the discussion is at your discretion. Please turn off your microphones for ease of communication. You may use the chat box for your questions or any feedback, and the moderator will relay them to the speaker during the allotted time. A certificate will be sent to your registered email address upon completion of the evaluation immediately after the webinar. All right, thank you everyone. So welcome to the Women and Phenomenology International Webinar. I am Edeline Kapili from the University of Santo Tomas, Manila. Um, just to share with you, this project was conceived by a graduate philosophy class on women and phenomenology under Dr. Jean Alpeniano and in partnership with the USD Department of Philosophy headed by Dr. Jovito Carino. So on that note, to formally start our program, may I call on the chairperson of the USD Department of Philosophy, Dr. Javito Carino, for his message of welcome.
Gandang gabi po sa kanilang lahat. I am uh, Jovi Carino, the program lead for philosophy uh, at the UST Graduate School. Phenomenology, especially phenomenology done by female scholars, is an underexplored, underdeveloped philosophic theme of the University of Santo Tomas. This is the reason why we welcome with gratitude this webinar organized by Dr. Gina Opiniano and her graduate class at the USD Graduate School. We also wish to thank Dr. Randolph Dible, Dr. Rowie Azada Palacios, and Father Francis Payo for lending us their time and scholarship to guide us and update us in our reflection on the legacy of female phenomenologists, namely Hedwig Conrad Marcius, Hannah Arendt, and Edith Stein. We also wish to acknowledge the support of the Dean of the USA Graduate School, Professor Michael Vasco. We hope the whole evening will be fruitful for all of us. Maraming salamat po, and welcome to USD. Thank you so much. Maraming salamat po, Dr. Carino. We appreciate your support to this endeavor. Speaking of support, we want to thank our speakers for accepting our invitations despite their busy schedules. Thank you po. We want to extend our gratitude specifically to Professor Randolph Dibel and Professor Rui Asada Palacios since they agreed to uh, have go attend this webinar despite the challenge of having to wake up early. Uh, we are very honored to have you tonight. Thank you, Paul. Uh, moving on, may I call on Associate Professor Flor Delis Alves Albella of the USD Department of Philosophy, a scholar and researcher whose interests revolve around phenomenology for her message. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I wish to convey my gratitude to the class for still having me over this evening, despite the unfortunate circumstance of a tight schedule that prevented me to be with you for the rest of the semester. Nevertheless, I consider this some sort of a Felix culpa since Dr. Gina Opiniano took over. At least a real feminist is taking the lead. You're able to transcend simple reading sessions and writing of essays, so more creative tasks that project our humble work to the public sphere. I'm happy to see that the work are converted into more contemporary exposure of female philosophers in social media public materials, and of course, this very webinar. Phenomenology calls for conscientious reflection with an awareness that is deep-seated, but at the same time, sincere in finding its object, which will always be being unseek or the thing in itself. In giving an orientation to this thought system, which is both a framework and method, it is necessary to mention these fundamental ideas, if I, or if I may call it tenets. That first, in phenomenology, Consciousness is and will always be a consciousness of, which highlights the value of object and content of the mind. With two, this consciousness as ever mindful of its own work must go back to the things themselves or to have a view of the complete picture of things. At three, one must suspend their bracket biases even if the mind is always shrouded by its forethought and foresight. Yeah. Such a hard task that it's oftentimes, or that its use oftentimes generate narratives that elaborate what a thing is according to how one finds such a thing is with objectivity by subjectivity that is only achieved by honest asking and earnest finding. A way of thinking that requires the mind and minding about the mind Phenomenological paragraphs responsibly explain by elaborating the theory's rhetoric and reflect, reflexive processing through lived experience. With this setup, virility is oftentimes assumed in the phenomenological hermeneutic, which is traditionally regarded as very masculine. 
This is because the use of phenomenology oftentimes lead to an ontology, which poses power in the assertion of beings as they are. And in our context, man as man or human as human. And for that, the women of phenomenology had to take twists that introduce new dimensions in talking about human consciousness and authenticity. I'll be a bit crude, but that's just my opinion, my reading opinion. It is found in Hedwig Conrad Marsh's real ontology, recalibrated in Erin's discourse and power, and perhaps most verbose in the positions of Stein and de Beauvoir whose phenomenologies have mindfully covered renditions on female subjectivity and empowerment. By the way, perhaps it is also important to note that the women phenomenologists, these three, were apprentices appre app apprentices to the phenomenological greats, Conrad Marshall and Stein to Husserl, Aaron to Heidegger, and the Beauvoir to Sartre. Their training could but indicate a loving struggle to emerge from the shadows in the language of their male mentors. And so in whatever ways they are called, female phenomenologists, feminist phenomenologists, or women doing philosophy, they and their contributions deserve recognition by sustaining discourses related to their works. With that is also a personal wish that a translation of Conrad Marsh's work in English would be available in local libraries. I so hope that they would be available soon, even if just in PDFs. As the class have already read and learned together for the past months, I happily think that tonight's webinar is their way of sharing the fruits of the term. As one of the Dominican motto goes, contemplata et contemplare ali istradere. And so I congratulate Dr. Gina Openiano and the class for coming up with this event. To our audience, thank you for coming over and please learn with us. Thank you very much and cheers. Thank you very much, Dr. Fleur, for your message. Um, now let's go on our rationale. Elaborating on it would be no other than our course facilitator, Dr. Gina A. Opinion. Thank you, Edel. Thank you, Dr. Fleur, for, yeah, for your message. A pleasant evening to all of you. So while I'm only to present the objectives of this webinar, please allow me to begin with my expression of gratitude to all of you, dear participants, for the positively overwhelming responses to the invitation to learn with us on women and phenomenology. Moreover, I thank Dean Michael Anthony Vasco of the Graduate School of the University of Santo Tomas, um, Dr. Jovito Carino, our program lead and chair uh, for philosophy, and uh, again, Dr. Fleur de Ries Altes Albella, one of our uh, resident phenomenologists in the philosophy department, if not in, in USD, for the support to this undertaking. Picking up from Dr. Albella's description of the project of phenomenologizing, I echo that phenomenology calls for what she calls conscientious reflection of our experiences. Something I believe the class has been earnestly, if not forcibly engaged in for the past few months of reading and discussing about phenomenology of the philosophers Hedwig Conrad Marshus, Edith Stein, and Hannah Arendt, and some other phenomenologists they crossed paths with. We are thankful for the crafting of this class that makes possible endeavors to examine things as what appears to us and its appearing and our conscious experience as uh, experience. These are thoughts we extracted from the few brave, brilliant, inspiring women phenomenologists who have made sure some sort of balance is possible in philosophy. However, there is still an aristocracy of sex in the world of philosophy, says Professor Jonathan, Jonathan Wolfe of the University Co College London, where women find it hard to thrive, or there remains to be such a perception that philosophy persists to be the most male-dominated discipline in the humanities, both in its population and its combative methods. 
with this rather blatant dynamics of philosophy as a discipline and its being contextualized in the academe and organizations, this webinar was conceived. I'm fortunate to have the chance to facilitate this class of able, critical, and creative graduate students who promptly acceded to take efforts to respond to the need to increase the presence of women in philosophy as it is deemed imperative and we, we claim it's about time we change the face of philosophy as male dominated. In the recent past, fortunately, initiatives anchored on this goal have been undertaken and are continuously being undertaken by academic institutions like the University of Santo Tomas, philosophy organizations in the country, and of course, independent scholars. This webinar is one of our commitments to help increase uh, the presence of women philosophers and I mean their thoughts and their contributions to the flourishing of philosophy. And we hope this is just a start of other possible initiatives to carry out this humble objective, which could take the form of broad broadening the curriculum through the inclusion of previously neglected works of women, introducing them in learning materials, like what one of my students will be doing for his uh, project, reading about their works as part of our philosophical discourses and such other innovative strategies. It is our hope that this webinar is indeed a concrete, concrete manifestation of this goal to genderize philosophy that is directed towards achieving gender equity, if not equality in philosophy. In conclusion, I also wish to end with gratitude the way I started with my speech. Thank you to our speakers for immediately accepting our invitation to take an important role uh, in this webinar. One of the speakers, Professor Randy Daibo, I had a chance to meet during a late night reading session and <clears throat> that was really a late night for the Philippines. Um, on one chapter of the book, Ontological Phenomenology of Hedwig Conrad Marshus, organized by the Society for the Phenomenology of Religious Experience. Thereafter, I had a chance to communicate with him for what turned out to be a collaboration for this webinar. The only woman among the three speakers, Professor Ro Rowi Azada Palacios, is my colleague in the group Women Doing Philosophy and a future fellow co-author in the collective work on philosophy of education. Uh, I hope I did not preempt the project. And the third speaker, Father Francis Payo, was my classmate in several PhD classes in the USD Graduate School, who became influential in my philosopher choice, Simone de Beauvoir, for my dissertation topic. Finally, to my students in women and phenomenology class, who I cannot thank enough for the great work they have put into this web, uh, webinar, um, my infinite gratitude to each one of you. In a special way, our class thanks as well the Varsitarian of the USD for being contributory to what I would like to proclaim and claim to be um, a successful webinar. So again, thank you all for being, in one way or another, instruments to the fulfillment of the rationale of this webinar. Let's enjoy this experience. Magandang gabi at maraming salamat po. Cheers as well to everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Opiniano, for your message and incessant encouragement to genderize philosophical discussions. All right, so let us begin our most awaited lectures on women phenomenologists, Henry Conrad Martius, Edith Stein, and Hannah Aaron. May I now call on Mr. Joselito Zulueta to introduce our first speaker. It is my pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Randolph Dybal. Randolph Dybal is a lecturer in philosophy at St. Joseph's College, New York. He is also a philosophy doctoral student at the New School for Social Research. His work is in phenomenology and ancient Greek philosophy. His master's thesis is entitled Phenomenology of the Spheres from ancient spherics to philosophical cosmology. He has recently published a chapter, Eternity, Time, and Reality, 
in Conrad Marsh's Cosmological Phenomenology in the book, Nature and Cosmos, Drafts of Early Phenomenology, edited by Hans Rainer Sepp, published, in, published only last year. He has forthcoming publications in Analepta Husoriana, the Yearbook of Phenomenological Research, and he is the editor of a forthcoming volume of Knots and Things called Laws of Form, a 50th anniversary, as well as a special edition of Sophia, the International Journal of Philosophy and Traditions. And this will be on the philosophy of Peter Manchester. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, may I introduce to you Professor Randolph Dybo. Thank you very much. Thank you um, everyone for this wonderful opportunity. <laughs> um, I'm going to include in the chat uh, to everyone the link to uh, my presentation or the, the, pre the presentation um, that you'll be seeing uh, when I share my screen here. Um, I will be reading something else, but um, the photos kind of go along with this. <clears throat> so I'm going to go ahead and start uh, sharing this and give my presentation. So, um, so as Dr. Opiniano pointed out, um, we have a reading group in the Society for the Phenomenology of Religious Experience that is ongoing. It is a, a careful study of Professor James Hart's book, Hedvig Conrad Martius's Ontological Phenomenology. So um, this presentation um, that you see now, this goes with that, and it's a living document I'm adding to it um, as we read very carefully. Okay, so um, this is Hedvig Conrad Martius. Here's Edith Stein and Gerda Walther. Uh, these are the women of early phenomenology. Of course, there are more to put on here. Um, next generation, Anna Teresa Temenetska is a very important figure, founder of the World Phenomenology Institute and the journal Analecta Husuriana. Um, and moreover, um, very full of energy as all these women are, um, knowing that they are part of this really, really profound um, philosophical movement. Uh, I would also include Lucy Rigori on here. Um, I'm gonna have to put her on there. But as you can see, here's Hedvig Conrad Martius in the center of the Göttingen uh, circle. Now, I'm just going to um, have these photos moving around a little bit as we proceed and then I'll go to the relevant ones when they become appropriate. <clears throat> so I'm starting with a biographical sketch so we all have an idea of who Hedvig Conrad Martius is um, because her story should be heard. It's, it's a very interesting story. Um, Hedvig Marguerite Elizabeth Martius, born February 25, 1888 in Berlin, was one of the first women of her time to pursue a university education. She was recognized during her lifetime as one of the greatest natural scientists and philosophers. Today, we might even argue, as I do, that she was one of the greatest philosophers of all time. But first, we should look at her time and the limitations that she faced. Conrad Martius was born in Rostock, daughter of Martha Martius and Dr. Friedrich Wilhelm August Martius. Her father was a university professor of medicine at the University of Rostock. Realizing his daughter had philosophical interests, he gave her a copy of Emmanuel Kant's Critique of Pure Reason on her 15th birthday, and this interest developed into a passion for philosophy. After her compulsory secondary school studies, which for women occurred at a special Hohera Totterschule, which literally means daughter's school, <laughs> She wished to continue to pursue an education. This was, of course, as difficult as possible for women. In order to obtain qualification for university entrance, only one possible route was available to women. They would have to go to the one and only school for girls in all of Northern Germany, the Helena Lange School for, uh, school for Girls, which Hedwig Conrad Martius did. For this special high school program, 
which took place in the afternoon at an ordinary school for girls. She had to take these afternoon classes for four years and then go to a different set of teachers at a grammar school for boys for her abitur examination under the observation of men who were opposed to the education of women at the Sophian Real Gymnasium in Berlin. In her 1958 acceptance speech for the Order of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany, she recalled that of the 31 girls in her cohort, only 12 in the last year remained. Of these, only eight passed the abitur without oral examinations. Two failed, and two, one of them being Conrad Martius, she said, quote, just managed to scrape through with the help of oral exams. In her speech, she explained that she was that this was because she was very hardworking and well behaved, but she simply didn't have a very strong inclination towards the subjects of the grammar school, where there was no philosophy course. At the end of one of her essays, one examiner wrote, inadequate, too abstract and philosophical. She passed the abitur and began her studies at Rostock, where she first majored in med medicine. Upon seeing a cadaver in her first anatomy course, she fainted and decided medicine was not her calling. Then she moved into literature, but later moved from literature to philosophy and burned her own poetic and dramatic literary works. Fortunately, though, her dialogues Metaphysica Gesprache and the theatrical Jesus unter der Toten are later examples of her dramatic philosophical work, and these we have. Um, and there, there's probably more as well in the Naklas to be uncovered. Hedwig Martius first studied philosophy under the neo-Kantian Friedrich Rickert at, in Freiburg in 1907. I'm gonna show you, um, by the way, Jesus and the Dead, um, a play that she wrote and that they performed her and the other phenomenologists in in Bad Bergsebern, um, and in it, Jesus speaks with Socrates, or with uh, Plato, and Aristotle, and Alexander the Great. It's really, really fascinating. One of, it's a very unique thing in itself. Um, so she first studied with Heinrich Rickert, and then in the fall of 1909, she moved to Munich to study philosophy and psychology under Theodor Lips. There she joined the Akademische Verein für Psychologie, established in 1895, also known as the Munich Circle of Phenomenology. Lips, by this time, was absent due to illness, but she attended the seminars of his students, such as Max Scheler and Moritz Geiger. Lips had studied Edmund Husserl's work and developed a stimulating academic and institutional relationship with the Göttingen phenomenologist, Husserl facilitating an exchange of students generally known as the Munich Göttingen Phenomenology Circle. Geiger insisted that she then advance to Göttingen to study under Husserl, so he wrote to Adolf Reinach, and the following semester she began seminars with Husserl and Reinach in Göttingen. In the winter semester of 1910-11, uh, there she would complete her studies ultimately in 1912. For a detailed look at the topics that she was exposed to during this first semester with Husserl, um, one could look at the lectures translated into English in 2006 by James G. Hart as um, it's called the basic problems of phenomenology, and especially look at the discussion of Conrad Martius in his translator's preface. Um, and in the, the link to the presentation that I'm giving, you'll also find it, um, it's back here in, in the end of this presentation. So during those years, she joined Alexander Coiré, John Herring, Dietrich von Kildebrandt, and among others, Hans Theodor Conrad, 1881 to 1969, one of Theodor Lips's nephews. Martius and Conrad fell in love, and the couple were wed in 1912, and she, she took the name Hedwig Conrad Martius. But shortly before that, in June of 1912, Hedwig Martius had her first international debut as a prize winning, uh, with a prize winning essay. Here's, here's one of the uh, newspaper clippings, uh, which was uh, three times more voluminous than an average essay. 
and part of it was be to become her dissertation. Word spread. This is June, okay, and, and um, so there's gonna be a June, July, and an August. This all happens very quickly for her. Uh, word spread that a woman had won the university's centennial essay competition. The picture appeared on the front page of newspapers around the world. See this San Francisco Cisco Examiner clipping. Uh, this fame is also how Edith Stein had first heard of this student at Göttingen to whom she would soon be spiritually bound and they were best friends. Once, once Stein had first set sights on phenomenology while still at the University of Breslau, a friend showed her an illustrated journal that carried a picture of the young woman who had just won a prestigious award for the philosophical thesis, Der Erkenntnis Theoretischen Grundlagen des Positivismus, on the epistemological grounding of positivism. Husserl was delighted that Hedwig Martius won, but some members of the committee did not think that a career in philosophy is appropriate for women. Her real gymnasium abitur from Berlin did not include a language certification in Greek, and this became the rule that barred her from getting her doctorate at Göttingen. She notes in the 1958 acceptance speech for the Order of Merit that, quote, a male student would certainly have achieved an exemption. An exception. Uh, she promptly brought her dissertation to Alexander Feinder at Munich, where there was no such rule. And in July of that year, 1912, she earned her doctorate with summa cum laude distinction. The thesis was later published as Zur Anthologie und Erscheinungslehre der Reelen Außenswelt on the ontology and doctrine of the appearance of the real external world. That same year, the couple moved to an orchard in Bad Bergsebern, close to the French border. There, Conrad Martius continued to write philosophy and host phenomenolo phenomenologist colleagues with enough frequency and organization to institute what her student Eberhard Ave Lallemont in Spiegelberg's History of the Phenomenological Movement uh, came to call the Bergsebern Circle of Phenomenology. The First World War and Husserl's move to Freiburg brought to an end the Göttingen Circle, but at the Bad uh, Bergsebern Orchard, the Conrads set up a phenomenology library and archive and continued to host such personages as John Herring, Alexandra Coira, uh, Edith Stein, Hans Lips, and Alfred von Zippel. And uh, in 1917, when Reinach passed away, um, they collected his philosophical works and brought it there. Uh, Edith Stein called this Das Phenomenologenheim, the Phenomenology House. Conrad Martius's research flourished at this time. She developed the foundations for the ontology of the real, the reala ontologie, real ontology, that grew into all areas of philosophy of nature and natural science, beginning with a general ontological morphology applied to the different empirical domains, such as physical, organic, psychical, spiritual, etc. This meant that she was making significant contributions to the ontological foundations of such diverse theoretical disciplines as phytology, botany, entomology, anthropology, paleontology, and so on. The development of the philosophical foundations of philosophy of nature led her to philosophical cosmology, which I will soon illustrate with the developments of her final phase of work in the 1950s. By the time Edith Stein moved to Göttingen, in 1913, Conrad Martius was gone, having moved to Bergsebern in 1912. Stein and the Conrads first met in Bergsebern in 1920. The orchard was productive through the First World War, but by the end of it, the war um, had ruined that productivity and it mainly became a house of phenomenology. There was an air of spirituality brought by the Göttingen style of phenomenologizing as well as the direct influence of the charismatic Lutheran Pentecostal Evangelical Schobdatcher Church that Conrad Martius belonged to. The realist phenomenology of Reinach, who died in the war in 1917, and of Jean Herring lent itself to spirituality. And the uh, style of philosophizing was a big influence on Conrad Martius and her spirituality. Upon a visit to the orchard at the end of 1921, Edith Stein, then an atheist, experienced her conversion to Catholicism and was baptized there on New Year's Day, 1922 with, the Con with Conrad Martius as her godmother. 
and wearing Conrad Martius's white marriage cloak, her wedding dress, as her baptismal garb. Not only the spiritual, but also the philosophical influence of Conrad Martius on the philosophy of Edith Schein is evident throughout the major works of the latter. They had a, um, a two-way collaboration. And um, I also just want to add that the spiritual resume of St. Benedict of the Cross, Edith Stein, um, you know, as well as the phenomenological resume, you know, being the, the early editor of the inner time consciousness phenomenology and um, developing so many aspects of phenomenology um, in really important ways. This is, this is very much um, something that Conrad Martius was, was also doing in spirit. So I actually consider Conrad Martius to be one of the, the great mystics of our time as well. Um, later on, Gerda Walther becomes you know, more explicitly a mystic and involved in um, supernatural, you know, paranormal things like clairvoyance and telepathy. Conrad Martius was also writing about clairvoyance and telepathy and, and so on in, in many of her works. Okay, so now I'm, if I'm doing okay on time, now I'm going to switch over to um, a more philosophical mode. And I'll be referring to uh, James Hart's book, since I am aware that the University of Santo Tomas Women in Phenomenology course has been studying that work. Um, and I have that loaded up in here. Here's the forthcoming book by Ronnie Marone. And um, here's Jim Hart's book that just came out last year. Okay. Um, if I have a moment, I can also explain some of these photos here. Okay, so that's her, right? And I hope you all have access to this so you can look at it at your leisure as well. But here she is in the Bergzeburn Orchard. Um, here's her and Theodore Conrad early on on a boat. Um, there's a lot of activity lately, uh, which is really good. Her work is still untranslated uh, for the most part. Um, some people have been translating little bits lately, and that's that's terrific. Um, forthcoming is um, Karina Gershvantner might do this uh, Metaphysical Gershvaka, and um, hopefully uh, James Hart will uh, maybe get around to doing um, Das Sein, one of her last books on ontology. Um, but you can see some examples here at the Center for the, the History of Women Philosophers and Scientists at Paderborn University. They have um, conferences every year, as well as a summer school. Um, forthcoming in Horizon is um, a special issue on the women phenomenologists at uh, KU Leuven, the Husserl archives. Have, there's a lot of activity. So these are just some examples. If you um, Google her name, the women of early phenomenology, you'll find these resources among others. There's also the Open Commons of Phenomenology, um, you can click on her and, and get her very long list of, um, which is not exhaustive, comprehensive. It's, it's a long list of all her works. Um, here's some examples of her work. Some are translated, you see. Okay. So, and there she is at the um, Order of Merit Honorary Degree Acceptance. Okay, so this um, presentation, the Google Slides presentation here has my, my reading of the book. Just for fun, you can see, you know, it stands out to me. I'll be talking about some of these topics. So I'm just gonna set it down right about here since this is one of the first things we'll talk about. In order to best understand the philosophy of Hedwig Conrad Martius, um, it will be good to begin with the intuitive force of her idea of a spiritual attitude illustrated through the analogy of seeing. Phenomenology is characterized by a mode of philosophizing wherein the philosopher enacts the phenomenological reduction, which is a kind of thought experiment in which the phenomenologist achieves an attitude of being intentionally directed towards pure, the pure givenness of experience in order to maintain the a priori state of pure experience, i.e. the primordially given experience 
purified of hypotheses and presumptions prior to inferential cognition, returning to what is essentially the givenness of experience. Postural calls this phenomenological seeing and sometimes speaks of essence blindness and essence intuition. Uh, the natural scientist, on the other hand, attempts the familiar kind of natural scientific production by bracketing out subjective factors leading to a controlled empirical experiment of encountering objective experience in a way that posits and assumes a natural idea of the world. And this is also called naturalism. For Husserl, this natural scientific positivism is not enough. In his 1900 Logical Investigations, Husserl declares that what distinguishes the phenomenologist is a return to the things themselves. And in his ideas pertaining to a pure phenomenology and phenomenological philosophy, he declares that we, the phenomenologists, are the genuine positivists. For Conrad Martius, the natural attitude is overcome by a spiritual attitude, which when it is not shut down or denied, but allowed to be, brings to fullness, to the fullness of givenness, um, the brings to the foreground of awareness, a kind of fullness of what is given. This can be thought of as a bringing to awareness the necessity of real, albeit transparent depth dimensions of whatever is actually given in consciousness. It's spiritual being, which we apprehend through our, spirit, through our own spiritual being. This is a kind of halo or horizon of each actuality. The spiritual being of the world and its things in the world are an extension of our spiritual being in the world with the world being the reality mutually indicated by our own reality. This is perhaps a very simple intuition and it is brought to light through the excessive positivity of what is given. There is an excess on the side of the given, the noema, as well as an excess on the side of the spirit, noesis. And within this context of effulgence on both sides of what gives, Holding patterns of mutually arising appearances rise to the level of rigorously scientific consciousness. James Hart discusses this on pages 10 through 14, and notice on page 12, that's this, uh, this statement. Uh, always already, we always already perceive the cabinets substant in its substantiality and reality. Uh, I know it's kind of hard to, to read on here. Uh, I apologize for that, but um, hopefully some of us have the original text. We also have the totally disclosed cabinet or whatever fully presents itself um, all around. It is as if we have spiritual stocked eyes, Stielaugen, that's right here the antenna-like eyes of a snail. On page 14, um, this is also described as our spiritual roundabout vision. It is right here. To this kind of vision, and I should emphasize that the point here is that this is a kind of vision that is more natural than natural vision more natural, the natural vision. This geistig Stielaugen, spiritual vision, um, all the veils have been lifted. For Conrad Martius, being in the world means that one's own real and quite natural being and all real and quite natural being can be seen and realized in its fullness as situated in a transnatural reality that exceeds what the natural attitude presupposes. In brief, there is more to reality than meets the eye. And I'm also going to bring us in this text, flipping ahead to page 44. In addition to the eidetic, the phenomenological, and the transcendental reductions, there is a real ontological reduction. 
This is described in section 2.6 of Hart's book, Transcendental and Ontological Phenomenology, where he compares these two modes of phenomenology. On pages 43 to 44, there is a series of three points to consider. Um, so if I'm okay on time, uh, we can look at these three points closely, but maybe we can um, just kind of skip to the third one here. Uh, the first is the phenomenological attitude in the narrow sense. The second is the phenomenological attitude in a general sense. And I think we'll get a sense of what these mean looking at number three. Finally, there is a specific sense of phenomenological, phenomenological attitude, which is proper to the real ontology. It is thus a real ontological attitude. Here, the enactment or non-enactment of the general thesis of the reality of the world is not a matter of indifference. Rather, its enactment is required. In the previous um, reductions, one does this thought experiment where you cancel the world or you, 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 you assume that you know, there's no world and that'll guarantee any lack of assumptions or presumptions that you're bringing to the experience. But in this case, um, the enactment is a necessity. So this is called the heuristic context. And uh, the German is voraus gespannten Rahmen. We'll look at that in a moment. Everything is seen, so to speak, as burgeoning forth or raising itself, ra raising itself up out of the real context in which it participates. The heuristic here means assuming the thesis of the world as a kind of learning aid, an hypothesis in the discovery or full disclosure of the reality of the world. It is a kind of pre-given and extended, the vorausgespannten, uh, literally means like a for giving out span thing or framework. In other words, we have a tangible visual aid to our spiritual prehension of the essence and reality of what is given. As such, the thesis that it is in this visual aid, the thesis that is in this visual aid fully operative or enacted as sufficiently approximate of the real that is pre-given and part of our original experience, albeit with a kind of purity that is discovered in the hypothetical positing of the world. Moving from the hypothesis of the world to an an-hypothetical founding dimension of space and time brings us to the last part of my discussion here, the philosophical cosmology of her ultimate systematics articulated in the 1950s in her trilogy, Die Zeit, 1954, Das Sein, 1958, and Der Raum, 1957. Um, these translate, of course, as time, being, and space. So I'm going to stop sharing this um, and just kind of speak freely about, about these things. So in her work, um, she you know, encounters Husserl's essence concept and um, the idea that the phenomenologists are co-workers with Husserl to, to study different regions and apply this method of essence analysis to different regions, um, which, which is meant in the, the widest possible sense. So um, for her, she focuses on the, um, the real ontology. She develops these foundations um, that are already in Husserl in some respect, and, and she explores different areas with them. So early on, she might study, like in the Metaphysica Gesprache, um, such imaginary fictional entities like nymphs and hobbits and, and spirits and ghosts, um, but also angels and demons. And of course, this also applies to people, um, real living people that you're having a, a real experience with, as well as distant people and dead people. So, so this applies to many areas. Um, 
famously like woman in garden applies it to fiction um so it can be applied to to narrative narrative to myth um she also applies it to myth but um but she's well known for applying it to natural science so so anyway she develops all this uh, philosophy of nature direction in the 1930s especially and um and then she starts developing this idea of a universal ontology. This is interrupted. Um, she can't get a teaching job because um, she has some Jewish heritage. So the the uh, the Nazi laws keep her from from getting a job during the around the, the war time. Um, but she continues to publish, and in 1940-ish, she um, develops this plan for a universal ontology. And within this, she brings over the, the 40s, she brings this um, philosophy of nature, which she had previously applied to like botany and phytology and, and even like paleontology and, and all these different areas. Um, she brings it to bear through, through physics to a kind of hyperspace physics. And this is actually um, really relevant today as well as um, in the specific area of quantum loop gravity. Some people are applying her thought. Um, some people were already doing it during her day. Um, at Munich, she had colleagues like Alois Wenzel, who were theoretical physicists working with Einstein. Um, and she um, develops these, these two concepts. And I think I can just, as, as the last thing here, um, Throw these out and hopefully you'll be able to see how they're connected to the spiritual attitude, the round, the, the, the bigger and, and fuller picture that she was um, doing since the beginning. So um, I will just end with describing these. So there's, there's two founding dimensions that she focuses on. One is, um, in and both of them are um, a kind of theoretical physics of hyperspace, sort of, um, where you take the the three plus one dimensional universe, like this room that I'm in is a, is a kind of cube, right? And it moves a long time. So it's like three dimensions plus one dimension. So call that the Minkowski-Einstein space-time continuum. So this, that, that means this space-time continuum. But, um, but this is also situated inside of a bigger four-dimensional um, spatial as well as temporal dimension. And this she calls the Aeonitia, Realmzeit Einheit, or the Aeonic space-time. And this is the place of eternity. So our world, represented as like space and time, um, is fitted into this bigger picture of eternity. Okay, in fact, she has a pretty cool diagram of this. Let me just um, go back to sharing real quick here. Um, So here's her diagram. This is discussed later on. There's this section, um, the ontological dynamic and the, um, the real ontology of space that you can find in there. And here is her diagram from Die Zeit. So our world, this three plus one dimensional world travels um, as a kind of like world disc, she calls it, through the fourth space-time continuum. Okay, so um, this is the realm in which, what she calls the intellectual essences, which are like energy or light, and the mass hyletic essences, you know, matter, um, complete themselves in a certain respect. Um, and these are to bring Aristotelian categories, a kind of Thomistic Aristotelian physics to bear on contemporary physics um, through her, her ontology of Einstein's relativity theory and also um, her analysis of the ontology of Heisenberg's quantum theory. Um, her colleague Alois Wenzel has a very similar diagram. Um, she was working in a, in a space-time reading group with him. Um, these are diagrams that are familiar to those who study relativity. Einstein's work. And um, okay, and then finally, there's another dimension that cannot be so easily diagrammed, and that's called the Apirisha, realm site Einheit, or the realm of the infinite. 
this is in the context of Heisenberg's, of her doing the ontology of Heisenberg's quantum theory. Um, it's kind of like the dimensionless founding dimension where the first dimension arises from. You can think of it like this. Um, this would be relevant for the idea of strings, you know, but um, something even more fundamental than that. So it's kind of like a reality sandwich where the space-time continuum is situated between a bigger, more encompassing dimension and like a, a founding dimension that in a way is also bigger and all-encompassing, which would also include the, the infinite space-time would also um, be the context for a five-dimensional, a six-dimensional and so on. Um, okay, so, so we went from this real ontological foundation um, and, and seeing a bit, maybe it's hard to do this so quickly, but to see how it applies to a philosophy of nature um, and natural science. Um, and finally, um, how it ends in this like big picture 1950s work on uh, philosophical cosmology as a kind of theoretical physics. That also has like, there's also theological dimensions of this. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Randolph Teibel, for your enriching lecture on Henrik Garnard Marcus's phenomenology. To our uh, participants, if you have questions for Professor Teibel, may I encourage you to type them in the chat box. And then after we finish the talk of all of, uh, of, all of our speakers, we will be raising them in our open forum. So likewise, if you have comments or you want to uh, join in the discussion later, you have uh, you can just put in your thoughts in the chat box so our speakers can look through it and check on it. All right, thank you. So introducing our second speaker, may I now call on Father Pacifico Misahon. Good evening, everyone. It is my honor and my privilege to introduce to you my close friend, <laughs> Father Francis G. Pai. Father uh, Francis Baihun Payo is a priest from the Archdiocese of Capiz. He took his philosophical and theological studies at the University of Santo Tomas, both bachelor and postgraduate studies. His thesis for the licentiate in philosophy is titled the Meta-Ethical Basis of Informed Consent in Human Experimentation. His thesis for the Licentiate Masterate in Theology is titled, God is Truly Our Mother, Julian of Norwich Showings of Divine Love. His dissertation for the Doctorate in Philosophy is titled, Edith Stein and Edmund Husserl on Empathy Towards a Comparative Synthesis, Summa Cum Laude. He currently serves as chaplain of St. Anthony College Hospital in Rojas City while teaching philosophy subjects in the two seminaries of the Archdiocese of Capiz, namely St. Thais X Seminary and Santa Maria Mater et Regina Seminary, as well as in the School of Graduate Studies at Colegio de la Purisima Concepcion, Rojas City. He has been a priest for 18 years. So without much further ado, let us now welcome Father Francis D. Payo, PhD, in his talk, Edith Stein's Relentless Engagement with Truth. Thank you. Hello, good evening. And uh, to others, good morning or good noon. I'm just happy to be here with you, especially that I know some of you are my former classmates, friends, and uh, colleagues. Wow, it's really a nice intimate time being with you here to share something. So I titled this um, sharing of mine Edith Stein's Relentless Engagement with Truth. But before I go on, uh, let me greet first um, uh, our seminarians at Santa Maria Mater Regina Seminarium who are with us right now. 
and also my, some my students at Coleo de la Purisima Concepcion, those who are taking their MA and their PhD. And they are all, some of them are also with us right now. And I'd like to acknowledge um, uh, seminarian Ray Gabriel Toledo, who helped me in this PowerPoint presentation. And also my student in graduate school, uh, Mark Bigas, for the technical help he is now giving me. Now, let the sharing of mine serve as a window to see at each time in a particular and perhaps deeper way. The sharing with you my particular lens to look at her and perhaps understand her better. But how shall I proceed? How shall we proceed? Of course, by telling you her story. So apparently it's a biographical account of Edith Stein. You know, after reading so many versions of her story, of her life way back in 2013, I have felt the urgency to retell her story based on the significant impression they have made on me. My version of her story revolves on her apparently most predominant concern and pursuit, that is, her lifelong and relentless engagement with truth. And just to share with you, this biography of uh, Stein, as well as the biography of Edmund Husserl, were my favorite parts of my dissertation then. So this is but a little excerpt of the whole thing. Edith Stein impressed me as an honest seeker of truth. And accordingly, her life may be characterized as a journey towards truth. Truth for her unfolded in many ways and in different forms. And due to its gradual unfolding, truth manifested to Stein in many phases, corresponding to the stages she was in her journey. At every stage, however, Edith was strongly motivated and zealously determined that she gave her complete dedication to it, as if all that had mattered to her was her quest for truth. Her life as a whole is extraordinarily difficult. And that would be a good introduction to her life story. Her beginning in her Jewish family was extraordinarily difficult. She was the youngest of 11 children born to German Jewish parents. And by the way, before we go on, uh, this would be the outline of my sharing with you. First, to share with you about the truth of her beginnings, which I've already started as extraordinarily difficult. Second, her search for truth in the confines of phenomenology. Third, how she was consumed by the truth of Christian faith. And fourth, her pursuit of truth in a cloistered life. And finally, her truth shining yet shrouded in mystery. Now let's go back to that first stage, the truth about her beginnings. As I've said, her life as a whole is extraordinarily difficult and her beginning in her Jewish family was not that easy. Notwithstanding her father's death, Edith and her six siblings were educated at reputable schools thanks to the enterprise and hard work of their mother who raised them with all her love and fidelity to their Jewish faith. 
the early manifestation of Ida's journey towards truth is her desire towards learning as a young student. Her intellectual brilliance and great diligence in her studies made her excel in school to the admiration of everyone. In the words of Walter Herb's Trief, she swallowed her textbooks like someone starved. Can you imagine that? She swallowed her textbooks like someone starved. Such extraordinary gifts endowed Edelstein the necessary capacity and disposition to pursue a lifelong engagement with truth as it manifested at different periods of her journey. The importance of her gymnasium classes cannot be overlooked since they prepared her thoroughly in the study of humanities and sciences, among others. The full blossoming of the human intellect, unimpeded rational inquiry, practical and theoretical understanding, respect for research, and the search for truth for its own sake were some of the prized ideals of this pre-university preparatory level. That is, allowing Stein to obtain a comprehensive academic excellence. Such experiences must have developed greatly Stein's mental gifts and stimulated her intellectual fervor that she needed no additional motivation to pursue further studies in a university. You know, it was then a privilege for those who have both the means and the capacity for higher learning and also an exceptional path for a woman in those days. Edith was undoubtedly gifted intellectually and she was blessed to have been supported by her family in this endeavor. Now let's go to the second stage of her journey. The search for truth in the confines of phenomenology she entered the University of Breslau at the age of 20. That was April 1911, with literature and philosophy as her chosen fields of study and teaching as her career, like most of us here. Aside from philosophy, she was also drawn to psychology as introduced by William Stern. Her knowledge were supplemented by learning she got from joining intellectual circles and diverse political groups. Berkman captures nicely Stein's university life in what follows, and I quote, in addition to her formal studies and teaching, myriad cultural events, theater, concerts, animated discussions with relatives and friends stimulated Stein's university life. The intensity of her curricular and extracurricular learning experience, the constant exertion of her powers gave Stein an exhilarating feeling of living a very full life. And according to her, I saw myself as a richly endowed and highly privileged creature. Stein's studies in psychology inspired her to understand our surrounding world especially delving into the truth of our human personhood. However, concerned with finding solid foundations for the sciences, which is the aim or goal of phenomenology in general, she was frustrated with the methods of psychology as inadequate to establish such grounding. So she turned her interest and attention to philosophy as it manifested in the realm of phenomenology. Her teaching, her reading of Edmund Husserl's logical investigations brought her at the helm of Professor Husserl in the University of Göttingen. She considered studies in phenomenology as the legitimate and rich ground of her search for truth. Husserl served as her mentor in her dissertation and eventually she served as assistant to Husserl for barely two years, 18 months to be exact. 
That close encounter did make her well acquainted with phenomenology and allowed her to wrestle and plunge deep into the issues of phenomenology. The ideogram you see right now is telling us the issues of phenomenology. That if you are to understand phenomenology, you will find at the heart the issue of intersubjectivity and at the crux of it, the issue of empathy. And there, Edelstein found the concern closest, concern closest to her heart, that of the human person. You know, this episode, though relatively short, no, I mean, her encounter with Husserl, it would prove to be crucial in determining Stein's work of collaboration in her reduction of Husserl's ideas too, and other works. She did not only serve as assistant to Husserl, but a collaborate, collaborator with him as well. It was during these years that she developed various acquaintances and friendships with fellow students and professors alike. An atmosphere created by the spirit of Husserl's phenomenological movement. Stein's studies in phenomenology showed the concerns closest to her heart, most especially the truth about the human person. The influence of Max Scheller and William, Wilhelm Dilthey are significant in Stein's growing under, understanding, specifically Scheller's philosophy of values and Dilthey's empirical empathic comprehension. Her subsequent researches convinced her of the inextinguishable uniqueness of the human person who lives at the same time in the state of spiritual interconnectedness with the rest of reality. Such conviction by Edith Stein may well characterize her lifelong pursuit, but most predominantly in the maturing and deepening of her journey towards truth. This eventually made her realize that phenomenology may not be enough to satisfy the yearning she has towards the truth of the human person, even though how relentless she was. It a struggle began immediately after leaving Husserl. Though she yearned to dedicate herself totally to the truth, she could no longer believe that scientific truth with which she was thoroughly familiar and she had the right to one's absolute devotion. For her, the eternal truth shown in the church, not the university. And it pained Husserl that she could not give an unqualified assent to his thinking, but he did his best to respect and appreciate her point of view. Despite their differences, however, Edith Stein and Edmund Husserl maintained a good relationship. As Bezart puts it, they continued in their mutual respect and affection for each other until his death in 1938, following her career with almost fatherly pride. The ideogram you are seeing right now tells us of a relationship of mutual influence and collaboration between Edmund Husserl and Edelstein. They were both of German Jewish descent, Christian converts, and committed to phenomenology. And in the next ideogram that you will see, there you see a relationship of mutual influence and collaboration between Husserl and Stein, not as a mentor and student, as a master and assistant and their continuing correspondence and work along phenomenology, which simply shows to us a relationship of mutual influence and collaboration. And since philosophy was central to Edith's very being, she continued her pursuit even beyond the confines of phenomenology without however abandoning the phenomenological method she exhibited her phenomenological approach all throughout her writings, even those which are characteristically theological and spiritual, like 
the science of the cross. The radical openness of phenomenology towards truth certainly ushered Edith Stein to a realm beyond explicit claims of phenomenology as originally envisioned by Husserl. Stein found its approach compatible with other approaches in so far as it is geared towards the discovery of truth. We can say that without a doubt, the phenomenological approach radically open for Edith Stein towards truth in general, and especially to the truth as enshrined in the Christian faith. Now let's go to the third stage of her journey towards truth when she was consumed by the truth of Christian faith. The restless yearning fueled largely by significant circumstances in Edith's life opened her eyes to the truth there may be in Christianity. And in this regard, it is important to mention how in her teenage years, she confessed being an atheist. Of course, that needs to be qualified. But what I'd like to emphasize to you is that the commingling and the interconnecting circumstances in the life of Edith Stein were responsible to her great awakening, namely her visit to a cathedral in Frankfurt. Her encounter with Max Scheller, with Max Scheller in his lectures, her encounter with Adolf Reinach, especially during his death and her encounter with his wife. And then finally, her encounter with St. Teresa of Avila when she read her autobiography. This co-mingling and intermingling circumstances in the life of Stein eventually convinced her to follow the truth that is Jesus Christ. And I'd like to pay special attention to this part now. Let me dwell further on each of these circumstances. Okay. Number one, her visit to a cathedral in Frankfurt. And I'd like to quote her words. She wrote, this was something entirely new to me. To the synagogues or to the Protestant churches which I had visited, one went only for services. But here was someone interrupting her everyday shopping errands to come into the church, although no other person was in it, as though she were there here for an intimate conversation. And I could never forget that. End of quote. There we see the impact it had to Edith Stein by her own words. And then secondly, her encounter with Max Scheller by listening to his lectures. According to Catherine Bazard, the world of faith was opened up to Stein through Max Scheller. According to Stein, it was my first contact with the world that until then had been completely unfamiliar. I can say that it led me directly to faith, but it did open up a whole new realm of phenomena that I wouldn't be able to pass by blindly anymore. The third circumstance, the passing away or death of Adolf Reinach. You know, Reinach's death, a professor highly respected and loved by Edith, brought her in close personal encounter with his wife, then a widow, and she was there to console her. But instead, she found consolation in a woman deeply convinced of the power of Christ's victory over death and suffering. And such encounter extremely important for Edith as she began her engagement with the truth of Christian faith. And her study of Adolf Reinach's writings deepened her understanding of religious faith and expanded her grasp of Christian concepts of love and death. 
And then finally, the fourth important circumstance in the life of Edith was reading by accident the autobiography of St. Teresa of Avila. She was deeply struck by it, saying after reading it, and I quote, this is the truth. And she elaborates what Edith, I mean, Berkman elaborate, Herb's, Herb Street elaborates what Edith Stein found in Teresa's autobiography was a confirmation of her own experience. God is not a God of knowledge. God is love. He does not reveal his mysteries to the deductive intelligence, but to the heart that surrenders itself to him. Th then and there, she decided to be baptized, a Catholic. And let me quote her words. It was in God's plan that this woman, who was not only con conscious of her femininity at the moment when she felt herself called to conversion, but as a woman philosopher, was also concerned with the truth to be discovered. That indeed was her own conclusion in those early morning hours after finishing reading the autobiography of St. Teresa. There is the truth. According to Sullivan, the great St. Teresa had opened the door to Edith Stein. Now, Edith Stein tells us that by becoming a Catholic, she felt truly Jewish for the first time in her life. But to her Jewish family, it appeared that she had left the fold. In the cross, she encounters the truth about Jesus as incarnate, as God-man. Here she finds truth not simply as an idea, but as a person. The fascinating thing to me about Edith Stein, according to Jane Nota, was that truth did not exist as an abstraction for her, but as something incarnated in persons and therefore as inconceivable apart from love. In fact, it is reckoned that her quest for truth is inseparable from her life, without which her works would never be understood adequately. Alasdair McIntyre sees this in her philosophical quest. It is also that she deliberately and intentionally brought her philosophical thinking to bear on the practices of her everyday life and drew upon the experiences afforded by those practices in formulating philosophical problems and arriving at philosophical conclusions. In other words, her life and her thoughts are inextricably connected or better still, one and integral for Edith Stein. Her whole life is a moving testimony to an integral quest for truth in all its manifestations, thus leading her ultimately to the truth of Christian faith. Catherine Bazard aptly observes that in the evolution of Stein's thought, we find a movement beyond the limits of pure reason to reason illumined by faith and religious experience. This seemed to be the epitome of her in her pursuit of the truth of the human person, not just as something human and finite, but something inevitably connected to the divine and the infinite. Before such encounter with the crucified one, Edith wrote in her autobiography, and I quote, I didn't yet have the sort of intellectual clarity where the mind relaxes after it has gained some new insight, sees the vistas and have opened up before it, and then advances with confidence. I grope around like someone in a fog." End of quote. Her encounter with the cross was a decisive moment towards her conversion to Catholic faith. That is, her unbelief collapsed and Christ shone forth in the mystery of the cross. She looked back 
at everything that happened in her life as providential towards and in view of her conversion. Her encounter with St. Thomas Aquinas taught her that faith has a further purpose as a path to truth, thus advancing the process centuries of Avila had begun in her. Now, the next stage in her life, in her pursuit of truth, is when she entered the monastery. That is her pursuit of truth in a cloistered life. All along in her restless and relentless pursuit of truth, Edith showed herself to be a scholar and teacher for excellence to the great admiration of Edmund Husserl himself and everyone she encountered. For several times, she applied for professorship in German universities, but failed, due largely to her being a woman and other reasons as well. Her doctorate in philosophy approved with summa cum laude honors was already a very extraordinary achievement for Edith at that time. According to Berkman, she is the second woman in German history to receive a doctorate in philosophy. Can you imagine that? Lauren Gaboriau notes that her official attempt to become a professor in university was the first in Germany. And she was given the chance by presenting a habilitation thesis, but she was refused. But you know, such disappointments only strengthened Edelstein and her initial inspiration to enter the religious life, something she found too difficult to pursue for fear of hurting her mother even more. And at this point in her journey, however, even her mother, a God-fearing woman, was amazed at the transformation happening to Edelstein that she was able to feel, though not to comprehend, the holiness emanating from her daughter. Eventually, after a long wait of more than 10 years, Edith followed her heart's inmost desire to fulfill a long cherished dream of devoting her life completely to God as a cloistered nun. So she entered the discussed Carmelites and henceforth she would be known as Sister Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, a name that signifies her vocation as an act of solidarity with the suffering of the world. Her presence was characterized by her great wit and laughter while in the monastery, her warmth, her affection and care with all the sisters. Even as a religious in the confines of a monastery, Edith was tasked several times to do scholarly work, something she thought to be part of her former life. As Gaboriau writes, she remained therefore more and more faithful to her vocation as philosopher, just as she remained faithful to her Judaism and to her femininity, but in a new manner. She assumed all responsibilities in the convent, whether domestic or scholarly, with utmost humility, diligence, and love. Such a life of total surrender and dedication to God is, I would say, her personal testimony to the mystery of the cross, which struck her at the core of her being. The many heart-rending events in the life of Stein, most especially when she was brought to Auschwitz with her sister, were according to Bay's heart, the darkness she had to go through. In her relentless search for truth, which eventually took the form of the cross, served as the beacon of light which guided her through the darkness. Herb Street beautifully recounts, yet despite the extreme darkness of the situation, her personal courage and spirit of affirmation enabled her to believe in the final victory of truth. 
Scott Spector describes Edelstein's demeanor in almost the same way. While on board a freight bound for Auschwitz, he said, they are in darkness, but she is in light. They are squatting on the floor, but she's standing. They are listless, but she is pensive and composed. End of quote. John Sullivan also describes it beautifully when she said, when she when he said she acted as a vessel of compassion, even in the most trying days of her life. Her humane behavior won out over the inhumanity imposed on her and her companions by the Nazi persecutors of her church and of her people. Her death at Auschwitz was simply the crowning glory of her relentless pursuit of truth, which she found in the mystery of the cross. How profound and amazing it is to realize that Edelstein finally found the truth in the mystery of the cross. But even more profound and amazing it is to behold that she found it in her total self-offering to the crucified one. And then the final stage or top part of my topic or outline is about her truth, shining yet shrouded in mystery. You know, Edith Stein's engagement with truth characterizes her life and person in playing, in playing various roles, at times simultaneously of being a philosopher, a translator, a teacher, an intellectual, particularly promoting women's role in society, a friend, and a cloistered nun among others, no one's to a great extent by belonging to a Jewish family and Jewish citizenry. She was constantly engaged towards her quest for truth in its ever expanding and ever deepening context. It promoted her human flourishing, particularly as a philosopher, a phenomenologist, and as a Christian or as a religious. It was her engagement with scientific truth, philosophical truth, and eventually the truth of Christian faith, where she found the ultimate purpose and profound meaning of her being. Disappointments and her eventual death may be considered as obstacles to her human flourishing, but you know, with the eyes of faith, they are but tests of one's faith and the way towards truth in its truest and most sublime sense. For ultimately, she was engaged not with ephemeral truth, but with eternal truth as personified and incarnated in Jesus Christ. You know, with the many testimonies about Edith Stein, I could not agree less with her niece's avowal. And I quote, as I study her writings, her letters, her poems, I sometimes feel that I come closer to understanding her than I could as a girl of 12 when I had my last conversation with her. But what she really was, the essence of her life and death will forever remain her secret. My dear friends, Edith Stein was born on October 12, 1891 and died on August 9, 1942, two months short for her 52nd birthday. We can say that she lived a relatively short life, but she lived it fully. Like a beautiful song, her convictions, her scholarly works and teaching blend harmoniously with her daily routine and relationships. In the words of Green, her wholeness as such represents a coherence of being an integrity lived out authentically. Her lifelong engagement with truth led her finally to behold the fullness of truth in Jesus Christ, the truth incarnate. And in total surrender 
possible only with the eyes of faith and with a heart burning for love of God. She did not only find out about the truth, she encountered the truth herself and her whole being was consumed by the truth. Not only in this life, but also beyond. I'd like to share with you her very words uttered from the abundance of her heart. Words that testify to this wonderful phenomenon which eludes the grasp of our rational mind. And so I'd like to close this little sharing or narrative with this parcel of testimony from Edith Stein herself, whom we in the Catholic world revere as Saint Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, Virgin and Martyr. And I quote, who are you, sweet light that fills me and illumines the darkness of my heart? You guide me like a mother's hand and if you let me go, I could not take another step. You are the space that surrounds and contains my being. Without you, it would sink into the abyss of nothingness from which you raised it into being. You closer to me than I to myself, more inward than my innermost being, and yet unreachable, untouchable, and bursting the confines of any name. Holy Spirit, eternal love. That ends my sharing. And thank you so much for the generosity you've shown in your attention and understanding. And let me end by saying, St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, pray for us. Thank you, Father Francis Pio, for your enlightening lecture on Edith Stein's phenomenology. Just like in our first speaker, I invite everyone to type in their questions for Father Pio in the chat box. And your comments are also very welcome and encouraged if there are any. Thank you, everyone. So to introduce our last speaker, may I call on Mr. Rick Daniel Edel. Good day, everyone. For our third speaker for today, Professor Rovi Azada Palacios is an assistant professor of philosophy at Ateneo de Manila University and a seminar tutor in education studies at University College London, where she is completing her PhD in philosophy of education under Paul Standish. She finished a master's degree in citizenship education at the Institute of Education in London, as well as master's and bachelor's degrees in philosophy at Ateneo de Manila. For her doctoral research project, she is building on Hannah Arendt's thought to reimagine how national identity can be taught in post-colonial settings. Let us welcome Professor Rovi Azada Palacios. Thank you so much, uh, Rick Daniel, um, and thank you very much, Dr. Opiniano, for this invitation. Um, it's an honor to be here, uh, to meet your students, um, and to speak with all of the wider audience um, who have so kindly signed up for this webinar. So I'm going to jump right in. Um, Arendt did call herself a phenomenologist. Um, her biographer, um, Elizabeth Young Brewell, reports that Arendt once said to a student, I'm sort of a phenomenologist, but not in Hegel's way or in Husserl's. My talk then is going to have four parts. Um, in the first three parts, I will answer the question, so in what sense was Arendt a phenomenologist? My answer to this question, um, just a moment, is it okay if we remove the slide? Uh, yes, so I can just show my, my slides, no, that's all right. So I can show my slides. There we go. OK, thank you so much. <laughs> OK, yeah. So my answer to this question is threefold. Um, Arendt was a phenomenologist broadly construed in terms of her training, in terms of her method, 
and in terms of her beliefs about thinking. So I'll end this discussion by exploring Aaron's work as a possible inspiration for feminist phenomenology, because I know that this is a class on gender and phenomenology or women and phenomenology. So let's begin. Um, in what sense was Arendt a phenomenologist? Um, Arendt was a phenomenologist because, first of all, um, of her philosophical training. Um, and talking about her training also allows me to give a brief discussion of her biography, at least in the first half of her life. Hannah Arendt, as most of you know, was a political thinker of the 20th century. Of the three philosophers featured today, she's the youngest. Uh, most of her work took place between the 1930s and the 1970s, which is when she passed away. Um, Arendt was born in Germany to a secular Jewish family. Uh, so this is a picture of her with her grandfather. Um, and below that is a picture of her with her mother. Uh, her father died when she was fairly young and she was raised mostly by her mother, who later remarried. Um, but Arendt was a very precocious, highly intelligent young teenager. Um, when she was just 14 years old, she was already reading Kant. Uh, she was already reading Karl Jasper's Psychology of Worldviews um, and Kierkegaard. Um, she also began at this age to learn Greek and to read Greek poetry. And it's quite funny because in a later um, uh, interview um, that she gave when she was much older, um, she was asked about this and she actually said that she didn't realize that this was unusual. She thought that all teenagers were like her, reading Kant at the age of 14. It was, it was only much later when she realized that she was extraordinarily intelligent compared to most of her peers. Um, so at a young age, she already knew that she wanted to study philosophy. Now, she was also quite strong-willed. Um, at the age of 15, she led a student protest against a teenager. So this was like the burgeoning um, political awakening of Hannah Arendt. Um, and that event actually caused her to be expelled from school. Now, her mother uh, decided after she was expelled from school to um, arrange for her to sit in um, classes at the University of Berlin. And it was here because of this that she was able to uh, attend university classes um, while she was preparing to take her high school leaving examination that would allow her to enter university. So at the University of Berlin, she came under the tutelage of Father Romano Guardini, um, who encouraged her interest in Kierkegaard. Now, although Kier Kierkegaard's work predates the Husserlian phenomenological movement, I think it's clear to all of those familiar with his work that um, there are many ways in which his style not only had an influence on the phenomenological movement, but also um, is very phenomenological um, stylistically itself because of his approach to showing rather than, I suppose, logically proving ideas. So at the age of 17, um, Arendt... Um, earlier than her peers, um, was able to complete the exam to enter university and she was admitted to the University of Marburg, where she famously became a student of Martin Heidegger. Um, now, this was the period in Heidegger's career when the influence of phenomenology on his work was quite strong. So this was the time that he was working on the ideas that would become uh, the book Being in Time and the Basic Problems of Phenomenology. And so Arendt heard a lot of these lectures before they were turned into a book. But after just about one year at the University of Marburg, she decided to move first to the University of Freiburg, where she attended Edmund Husserl's summer lectures. And then after this, um, she enrolled at the University of Heidelberg, which is where she remained under the tutelage of Karl Jaspers. Um, now, a lot of people make a lot of fuss about um, her relationship with Heidegger. And certainly, um, Heidegger was a very uh, influential philosopher in her life, but it was really Karl Jaspers who not only was the most constant um, educational presence throughout her life, but you know she remained friends with him until the day that he died. Um, and she would, even after she moved to the United States, she would still visit him every year um, in, in Basel, in Switzerland. And she actually, I think, gave um, uh, one of the eulogies um, at his funeral. Um, so she remained Jasper's student until she finished her doctorate. Um, Jaspers, um, as I think most of you probably know, was also a psychiatrist apart from being a philosopher. Uh, before he became chair of the Department of Philosophy at Heidelberg, he was previously a faculty member at the Department of Psychiatry. And Jaspers was responsible for bringing a phenomenological approach to the study of psychiatric practice. Um, 
Jaspers uh, would describe phenomenology not just as an intuition of essences in the way that Husserl did, but rather a descriptive approach that could help psychiatrists understand um, the psychopathologies of their patients. And so this phenomenological in influence was uh, quite um, apparent in Husserl's, uh, sorry, in Jasper's um, psych psychiatric and psycho psychological writings. So Jasper's brought this same phenomenological intuition into his practice of philosophy as well. Um, and he saw philosophy as a practice that must, in his words, pervade an individual life um, at a given moment. And this is something that Arendt also um, adopted for herself. This is something she learned from Jaspers. She described the relationship between reasoning and praxis as an approach to doing philosophy that she actually learned from him. So Arendt remained Jasper's student all the way until her doctoral, through to her doctoral studies. Um, he was her supervisor for her doctoral thesis on the concept of love um, in St. In the work of Saint Augustine, which she completed in 1929, um, after completing her doctorate, she began working on her habilitation shrift, her habilitation, which is the additional thesis that German academics are required to write before being accepted um, for an academic post to work in a university. Arendt had originally planned to write her habilitation on. German Romanticism. However, her mother came across the letters and correspondence of a particular figure from the German Romantic period, which was Rahel Varnhagen. And she gave um, this, you know, this, this um, compilation of, of correspondence, of Varnhagen's correspondence to Arendt. And Arendt became absolutely fascinated uh, with these letters. And she decided to shift her focus from the broader um, study of German Romanticism, more specifically to the life and writings of Rahel Varnhagen. Now, who was Rahel Varnhagen? She was a Jewish woman who lived from the late 18th to the early 19th centuries. And she was primarily, um, she primarily became known to the intellectual world because she was um, a host of a salon. So what was a salon? Um, literary salons were features of intellectual life during the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, I'm not sure what the equivalent today would be. Um, some have, you know, likened it to reading groups um, or even just like, you know, dinners among, you know, the intellectual literati of a society. Some have likened it to TED Talks. Um, but these were essentially social gatherings that were held you know, fairly regularly and would be attended by philosophers, writers, and the other literati of the society. And these were, I think this tradition started in France, but it spread quickly across Western Europe. Um, and these social gatherings were a common place of intellectual productivity that took place outside of the university. Um, what was interesting about the salons is that they were usually hosted by women, and a lot of the attendees were women. And therefore, these salons ad afforded European women the opportunity to be at the center of European life. Um, and in this slide, I have a painting of a literary salon hosted by Duchess Anna Amalia of Saxe-Weimar with Goethe and Herde both uh, present um, in the painting. So in Prussia, including Berlin, many of the salon hosts were Jewish women. Outside the salons, Prussian society discriminated against the Jewish community. And so Jewish women who dreamed of an intellectual life were marginalized twice over by Prussian society. As women, they were not admitted into formal education, you know, such as the universities. And um, they also had limited and uh, civil and political rights, as was the case across much of Europe. And as Jewish people, they were shunned twice over okay, by society. And so the salons that Jewish women women hosted were really a way of kind of fighting back and resisting uh, this marginalization. And these social gatherings gave Jew Jewish women an entry point into Prussian intellectual and, and um, literary society. So Rahel Varnhagen was one of these Jewish salon hosts. Um, and Arendt found herself drawn to her life because of the parallels between their lives. Uh, they were both Jewish women who were drawn to the intellectual life. Um, Arendt actually became a little bit obsessed uh, with Varnhagen to the point that she would later say, that there were times when she could no longer distinguish between her own thoughts and Rahel Varnhagen's thoughts. Of course, in many ways, their lives were also very different. Um, Varnhagen did not have um, the kind of formal education that Arendt was fortunate to have, yet they were both very sharp, they were both very intelligent, um, and they both also shared that Jewish identity. Um, 
so like Varnhagen, Arendt also, uh, so, sorry, Arendt saw that Varnhagen, like her, was also someone who struggled with what it meant to have Jewish identity and to be Jewish in the midst of a society that discriminated against Jews. During Varnhagen's time, Jewish people had to disengage from their Jewish heritage, um, or rather were pressured to disengage from their Jewish heritage and Jewish traditions to assimilate into the Christian traditions of Germany and even the Christian religion of Germany to gain social acceptance and not to mention, you know, um, uh, political power. So while Arendt was writing and working and doing this research for her habilitation shift, her habilitation, this was also um, coincidentally the time of the growing political movement um, of anti-Semitism in Germany. And Arendt was very aware that this was growing in danger, much more than Karl Jaspers was in her correspondence with Karl Jaspers. You can see that Karl Jaspers was still a little bit naive about how dangerous anti-Semitism was going to be. But Arendt was already beginning to recognize that this was going to be a very, very dangerous movement. Um, in November 1932, the Nazi party gained many parliamentary seats um, in the election of that year. But the turning point for Arendt was the burning of the Reichstag in February 1933. Um, to use an equivalent in the Philippines, the event was similar um, to, I suppose, Marcus, uh, Ferdinand Marcos's declaration of martial law in 1972. A few hours after the building was burned, the government abolished freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of privacy, and freedom of the press. 4,000 people, including many who had just won the November elections, or those who were running in the elections that was going to happen a few weeks later um, on March 5th, were illegally arrested, imprisoned, and tortured over the next few days. And so later, Arendt would say that this event um, this burning of the Reichstag and the arrest that happened soon after, this was really like a way, an awakening moment for her in her political life. So Arendt then became more involved in the political movements of the time. Uh, she became more politically aware, recognizing that German society was becoming increasingly hostile to the Jewish community. She joined the Zionist organization that was headed by Kurt Blumenfeld, which was seeking for a Jewish homeland. One of the tasks that Kurt Blumenfeld asked her to do was to start keeping a record of all of the public statements that Nazi politicians were publicly making against Jews. I suppose the idea was you know, for future accountability. So she would go to the library and, and uh, conduct research for this task. But in the course of her doing so, she was arrested and she was sent to a prison camp for a few days. Fortunately, all of her notebooks were written in code and so it was hard to press charges against her. Um, and she was a, a prison guard um, who was guarding her, felt sympathetic towards her, and actually released her uh, and allowed her to escape. But because of this imprisonment, uh, you know, she realized that she was her life was really in danger. So she and her mother, and then later, soon after that, her husband, um, Gunther Stern, her first husband, fled Germany. So um, they first fled to Czechoslovakia, and then eventually they found their way to France, where they were refugees, like a lot of other Jewish people at the time. And in France, she worked with Jewish charities and Jewish organizations that helped Jewish teenagers escape from Germany, um, usually uh, to find a place in Palestine to live. Um, so. All through this time, she was, you know, she was at, still working on her habilitation um, on 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 Rahel Varnhagen. So she actually, you know, while she was escaping Germany, she actually brought all of her notes and her manuscript uh, with her. Um, Gunther um, Stern, her first husband, and and her eventually divorced while they were living in France um, because. Um, uh, Stern decided to emigrate to the United States with his parents, um, and at the time, Arendt did not yet want to go. Um, but uh, Arendt then met and married her second husband while she was in France, who was Heinrich, Heinrich Blücher. So in 1940, Germany invaded France, um, and half of France surrendered to Germany, while the other half remained controlled by the French resistance. Um, Arendt, her husband, and her mother were all sent to refugee camps. Arendt and her mother were um, sent to this camp. Um, in my picture, uh, that's it, uh, Camp Gour. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, in France. And her husband was at a men's camp uh, also in France. 
At Camp Gore, she was able to get a hold of papers that would allow her and her mother to escape the camp. And she was later reunited with her husband, and they were who was also able to escape his refugee camp. Uh, so the three of them tried to find a way to escape Europe. And in 1941, um, the th all three of them were able to board a ship from Portugal to the United States. And this is a picture of uh, the kind of ship that Arendt would have uh, ridden. Um, so this specific picture um, is a picture of Jewish refugees, including children from internment camps in France, boarding a ship in Portugal headed to the U.S. So in the United States, um, Arendt lived as a refugee and as a stateless person uh, before eventually being granted American citizenship in 1950. For the rest of her life, she would be, be based primarily in the U.S., um, although after the war, she would also make frequent trips back to Europe, especially to Switzerland to visit Karl Jaspers. Throughout um, her escape from Germany, as I mentioned earlier, she Arendt brought with her her habilitation manuscript, and she was finally able to publish it in 1959, uh, so long after the war. As we saw, Arendt's university training all the way uh, to the writing of her habilitation was really shaped by a phenomenological approach, broadly speaking. From her various teachers, Heidegger, Husserl, Jaspers, she had been exposed to this idea that philosophy must return to the phenomena, must return to the appearances, it must return to experience. And this was an idea that she held very strongly. I personally see this very clearly in the way that she decided to write her book on Varnhagen. If you read the book, it's written in a very fascinating style. It's not a book about conceptual construction. Rather, the tone of the book is very much like the work of French phenomenologists in that it moves between personal reflection or contemplation and theorization. What makes her method unique, however, is that she does not... Um, do this through an, a description or a reflection on her own experiences, but through Rahel Farnhagen's experiences, in that she tries to enter into Farnhagen's mind. And this was a, a method or an approach that she would actually write about later on. In her later work, Arendt would talk about the importance of visiting that is trying to see issues from other people's perspectives. And this would become an important cornerstone of her later political thought. She believed that even if a perspective is different from my own, we have the capacity to visit another person's perspective. And this idea is very evident in her style of writing for this book. So what I've just given you um, is a description of um, her biography and an attempt to show the first half of her life and an attempt to show uh, the different ways or the different people who trained her phenomenologically. But now in the second part of my talk, I want to show that Arendt had a phenomenological approach or a method in the way that she wrote her ideas. Now, this part of my talk is based on a paper that will be coming out um, hopefully soon um, in the Journal of, Philo of, of Philosophy of Education. So I don't know, I don't have the proofs yet, but hopefully um, in the next few months um, it should be out. So if you're interested in hearing more about this, please do look out for that article when it comes out. So I will be discussing three articles that Arendt wrote about education in the 1950s. So my field is philosophy of education. Um, and these three articles, Reflections on Little Rock, The Crisis in Education, and A Reply to Critics, um, I present as an example of Arendt's movement from experience to theorization. Of these three articles, Arendt wrote Reflections on Little Rock first. Um, it was actually an opinion piece. It was a piece that was originally commissioned by the editors of a magazine called Commentary, who asked her to write an essay responding to the events that were taking place, that had taken place beginning September 1957 in the city of Little Rock, Arkansas. The 1950s were at the time of the civil rights movement in the United States. Um, and the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or the NAACP, had, since the early 1950s, been working to end the racial segregation of schools in the southern states of the United States. So as we know, during uh, prior to this time, um, schools in, the US, in the, some states in the U.S. were segregated by race. 
So the U.S. Supreme Court had decided with finality in 1954 that all state laws mandating or permitting the racial segregation of schools were unconstitutional. The affected states then had to begin desegregating their schools at different speeds. But many government officials and citizens from these states were against the, de the desegregation of schools. In Little Rock, Arkansas, the NAACP arranged for nine teenagers ages 14 to 17 years old, to be the first black students of Central High School. Because the Arkansas Governor Orval Faubus and several Arkansas citizens refused to comply with the Supreme Court decision, President Eisenhower sent the National Guard to prevent riots from occurring and to accompany the teenagers as they went to school, as you can see from this uh, picture down here. The students entered the school for the first time in September 1957 amidst, amidst jeering crowds. And this is one of the most famous uh, photos from that day. The incidents attracted international press coverage. Uh, this was like front page news, um, not just in the U.S., but across the, uh, in many places across the world. And these events came to be known as the Little Rock Crisis. Arendt would later say that it was one of these newspaper photos of the event that triggered the essay, the reflections in the essay that became reflections on Little Rock. Arendt said, the point of departure, would, she would later say, the point of departure of my reflections was a picture in the newspapers. And my first question was, what would I have done if I were a Negro mother? Her answer was that she would feel that the Supreme Court ruling, and I'm quoting here, unwillingly but unavoidably had put her child into a more humiliating position than before by exposing her child to conditions which made it appear as though it wanted to push its way into where it was not wanted. The essay reproached the adults who were involved in this unfolding drama, the NAACP, the town's law-abiding citizens, and, the, and that's in quotes, and the federal court system, all of whom she felt had left these youngsters at the hands of the mob, again, uh, her word, mob. Her specific criticism against the NAACP was that they had used the pupils to further their political agenda and exposed them to harm. While she shared the aspiration of racial integration and the desegregation of schools and of society more broadly, she opposed the NAACP's decision to focus first on the mandatory desegregation of schools. So this was one of the early, I suppose, projects of the NAACP. And she said that um, the NAACP should have focused first instead on so-called anti-miscegenation laws or laws against mixed marriages, which should have been, in her view, their first target instead. So this essay was very controversial. Uh, Arendt was a public intellectual who was well-respected um, in liberal circles. And suddenly this essay where she was actually criticizing the NAACP for what they had done here suddenly appeared to put her on the, on the non-liberal side of the debate. Although most people had expected Aaron to support the mandatory desegregation of schools, it appeared from this essay that she was not expressing um, her support for it. Um, and so as a result of this, this essay didn't actually get published right away. The, the Jewish magazine suddenly had second thoughts. The, the magazine that originally commissioned it suddenly had second thoughts about publishing it. And, when they, and it was finally published about two years later in a different magazine. And when it was published, it was published with, um, immediately with responses from people who disagreed with her. So, um, but what I want to focus on is really her style of writing. So throughout the essay, Arendt's style of writing shows that it was her unique phenomenological approach that led her to her unpopular conclusion. Throughout the essay, Arendt tries to put herself in the shoes of the 19-agers, just as she had done when she was writing uh, her habilitation, uh, putting herself then in the shoes of Rahel Farnhagen. In one part of the essay, Arendt writes, the girl obviously was asked to be a hero. That is something that neither her absent father nor the equally absent representatives of the NAACP felt called upon to be. Um, at around the same time, 16-year-old Beals, one of the nine, penned these similar lines in her own diary. She wrote, please God, let me learn how to stop being a warrior. Sometimes I just need to be a girl.
when Arendt's essay was finally published in the magazine nineteen uh, in nineteen fifty nine in the magazine Descent, um, it was as I mentioned published alongside three criticisms from other uh, writers. And in a succeeding issue of the magazine, she wrote another essay responding to her critics entitled "A Reply to Critics." And in that essay, Arendt continued with this uh, uniquely Arendtian phenomenological approach. Um, again, trying to put herself in the shoes of somebody else and trying to um, reflect on their experiences and allowing a theory to develop from that reflection. So Arendt wrote that the psychological pain of being placed in a social group where they were not wanted could be more difficult to bear than outright persecution. Um, and again, this essay shows her astuteness at understanding what the teenagers were going through. In a memoir that he wrote five decades later, Terence Roberts, um, the, the young man here in the picture, um, the teenager in the picture, wrote about the crippling fear that he felt while he was at Little Rock uh, Central High School, a fear that he described as much greater than I could have ever imagined, a terror we felt in our bones. Aaron's act of visiting, however, did not merely end with these personal reflections. Um, she used these reflections as a basis for theorizing. In a reply to critics, she, she wrote, if I were a Negro, I would feel that the very attempt to start desegregation in education and in schools had very unfairly shifted the burden of responsibility from the shoulders of adults to those of children, showing now the development of her thought from these experiential reflections to the theorizing that she developed about schools. And this was a theorizing that was expanded both in the essay Reflections on Little Rock, as well as in an essay that she wrote a few months later after Little Rock, which was The Crisis in Education. So in Reflections on Little Rock, she took her reflections about the 19 agers as a point of departure for a discussion, a lengthy discussion, about the distinction between social and, and political spheres. Meanwhile, in the crisis in education, she developed a manifesto of sorts for what she thought education should be. And I'll just quote uh, these short sentences to give you a sense of the flavor of what, of what she says about education. She writes, education is the point at which we decide whether we love the world enough to assume responsibility for it and by the same token, save it from that ruin, which except for renewal, except for the coming of the new and young would be inevitable. And education, too, is where we decide whether we love our children enough not to expel them from our world and leave them to their own devices, nor to strike from their hands their chance of undertaking something new, something unforeseen by us, but to prepare them in advance for the task of renewing a common world. In these three articles, then, um, Arendt showed this movement from personal experience to theorizing to be the hallmark of her method. And the same approach is visible throughout the rest of her writings, so much so that Arendt did not even consider herself to be a philosopher. Um, in 1964, she was visiting Germany, and she was invited to do a television interview with a German journalist, Gunther Gauss. In that interview, Arendt said, I do not belong to the circle of philosophers. For me, writing is a matter of seeking this understanding, part of the process of understanding. What is important to me is the thought process itself. And th these words lead me then to the next part of my talk, which has to do with Arendt's beliefs about thinking. Arendt's reflections on thinking are evident in the later works that she wrote, especially in the 1960s. Um, some of you are probably familiar with one of her most important works, Eichmann in Jerusalem, where she argues that what makes a person capable of doing the things that Eichmann did was precisely a lack of thinking. Arendt would talk more about her meth, her so-called method, and describe her be beliefs about thinking there, but also in some of her other works. So I want to go back to um, something which is accessible, which is these interview comments that she gave to Gunther Gauss, where she explicitly talks about the reason why she did not consider herself to be a philosopher. And this was because, to her mind, philosophy, at least as it usually occurred in the academe, often consisted of conceptual system building. It was more concerned with hardened thoughts rather than the activity of thinking. And this is why Arendt said, what is important to me is the thought process itself, the activity of thinking. In the same interview, she continues by saying, 
I do not believe that there is any thought process possible without personal experience. Every thought is an afterthought that is a reflection on some matter or event. Isn't that so? These phenomenological roots are also visible in, in her actual written works and her unfinished book, The Life of the Mind, uh, which she was in the middle of writing when she died in 1975. Um, she goes through a history of philosophical thought to show how different philosophers understood the activity of thinking. Towards the, the latter part of the book, she writes two chapters about Socrates, uh, whom she considers to be the thinker par excellence, precisely because he did not allow his thoughts to reify or harden. Um, and she cites the fact that he never wrote anything down as an example of that. And in one of those chapters, she describes the process of thinking this way. She says, we can use the word house for a great number of objects, and she gives examples of different houses. But as a word, house is a shorthand for all of these things. The shorthand without which thinking and its characteristic swiftness would not be possible at all. But the word house is something like a frozen thought that thinking must unfreeze whenever it wants to find out the original meaning. She continues a few pages down uh, to say, the manifestation of the wind of thought is not knowledge. It is the ability to tell right from wrong, beautiful from ugly. And this at the rare moments when the stakes are on the table may indeed prevent catastrophes, at least for the self. So I think that these quotations, and of course there are others throughout this book, demonstrate Arendt's belief in what the philosophical approach ought to be. And in that sense, Arendt was not merely replicating the beliefs about the phenomenology that she had received from her mentors. She was also extending the phenomenological tradition, altering it somewhat beyond what Husserl and the phenomenolo phenomenologists of her university training had done. So in what specific ways did she extend phenomenology? First of all, in the same way that Jaspers had brought phenomenology into psychiatry, I think that Arendt brought phenomenology into political thought. If you read a lot of political philosophy, you'll know that there's something very distinctive about Arendt's style of doing, phenomen uh, of doing political thought. And I think this is attributable to her phenomenological approach. She does not build logical conceptual arguments. Rather, she describes political experience. And as a reader, the experience is not be of being convinced by her logical flow, but rather it is an experience of recognition. Yes, what you're describing, Aaron, that's what I experience too. She puts into words the experiences that we undergo or phenomena that we have observed. As Sophie Loadolt has written, um, and she wrote, Sophie Loadolt is a philosopher who wrote about the phenomenological um, characteristics of Arendt's uh, work. She, she, she writes, Arendt's method methodology is similar to Levinas's. She begins with a core phenomenon, the experience of plurality in political events, and from this develops an understanding of what it means to be a political being. I think Arendt also extends phenomenology in a second way. For Arendt, the strength of, phenom of, the, of phenomenological thinking, and in this sense, she's different from Husserl, was that it was always on the move. It never ended. In the cycle between thinking and experience or praxis, a person could never assume that one's conceptualization of the world was final, because thinking, as she had put it, dissolved the frozen thought. For Arendt, this was not just a characteristic of the philosophical method. This was a central normative principle of politics and the political life itself. Arendt believed that one of the greatest dangers of political thought was ideology. That is, she thought that one of the most dangerous and harmful threats to political life was when thought became systematized and dogmatized, such that political actors thus became more intent on defending the logic of ideology itself rather than engaging in politics. This was the characteristic, she believed, of totalitarian ideologies, regardless of whether they were on the left or on the right of the spectrum. And she wrote about this extensively in her book, The Origins of Totalitarianism. In that sense, she reinterpreted the traditional maxim Sozenta phenomena to save the appearances or to save the phenomena. For her, it was important that thought always had to move. It always had to return back to real life and be unfrozen by real experiences. A third way that Arendt extended phenomenology is her development across her work of a phenomenological ontology and the phenomen phenomenology of plurality. Though these themes are evident throughout her work, this, they become most evident in her book, Life of the Mind. And I'll quote uh, Loa Dolt's um, uh, commentary about this. She writes, 
um, in Life of the Mind, Aaron develops a fundamental ontology based on appearance. We are of the world in the sense that the world of appearance is our home, which we never leave. We never stop appearing in the world, even if we're occupied with the activity of thinking, which allows us to distance ourselves from this immediate realm of appearances to make sense of it. Okay, so I know I'm running out of time. So, um... So far, I've talked about three different ways that Arendt was a phenomenologist, her training, her method, her beliefs about um, thinking. I've also talked about the ways in which Arendt extended phenomenology beyond what the so-called fathers of phenomenology believed phenomenology to be. So in, the la in this last section, I just want to highlight a few um, themes in Arendt's work that might be useful for those of you who want to see how, what contribution she might have to a feminist phenomenology. Arendt is not typically seen as a philosopher of gender. She wasn't a feminist um, in the traditional sense of the word. She did sometimes comment on her own position as a woman in a male-dominated sphere. Um, but what many, I think, feminist phenomenologists have found are some interesting sources of inspiration from a number of her um, themes, and I'll highlight three. One is the theme of natality. Uh, of beginning, of birth, um, that's evident throughout her work. So that as opposed to the existentialist philo tradition philosophers who write about how we are beings towards death, Arendt always focuses on the fact that we are beings of birth, right? We are beings who have been born, who are therefore capable of renewing the world. The second is labor. Um, and what's interesting about Arendt is that unlike Marx, who simply talks about labor as, you know, working on the world, Arendt includes in her definition of labor, the labor that women undergo during childbirth as another form of labor and as part and parcel of what we understand labor to be. And she writes about this in The Human Condition. And the third is loneliness. And this has been developed by the philosopher Kimberly Maslin, who says, um, Arendt suggests that individuals who are placed in the position of renouncing language, culture, or experiences cease to be able to present themselves in the world with authenticity. Women face considerable social pressure to find in marriage and motherhood profound satisfaction, which is at, often at odds with their lived experience. These pressures leave women struggling to attain humanness. So to summarize, um, I've talked about the ways in which Arendt was a phenomenologist. I've ended with some concluding thoughts about um, some possible directions for feminist the um, phenomenology. And um, that ends my talk. And if I'm happy to send the slides out uh, to anyone who's interested. I included a bit of a bibliography in my slides for those who want to explore her work a little bit more. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Professor Rowena, for your enriching lecture on Hannah Arendt's phenomenology. So likewise, if you have questions for Professor Rowe, kindly type them in our chat box. Thank you very much to all our speakers. Now, uh, let's try to entertain the questions from our participants. Um, okay, so the first question we have here is from Enrique de la Torre. And I think it's about Henrik Conrad Marcus's phenomenology. So I think uh, Professor Randolph Dybel would be very interested to answer it. So his question is, can we consider that human consciousness is bounded by meta dimension, which could have described human experience with meta description? Is this, this, is this to describe consciousness in terms of heuristic context, so to get the real ontological reduction, is it possible to access this meta dimension where the real ontological attitude resides? So, Professor Dybul, um, I, I hope you could enlighten us to with with regards to the question. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Enrique. Um, right, so. I mean, description is a technical term in phenomenology. Um, it also carries the, the normal sense of just, you know, description in general. Um, but it's also a technical term in the, uh, the ancient science of phenomena, um, which is properly the, the science of astronomy or, or even uh, more specifically what's called astrologia, 
or Spyrike. Um, th so these ancient Greek sciences, which are really like about, you know, the heavens and, and the stars, um, is the original meaning of the word phenomena in this context. Um, this then gets applied to um, things around us, the mundane things, the things of the sublunary realm, the, the things of the world um, in the philosophy of Plato and Aristotle, um, where the, the ancient roots of phenomenology, um, contemporary phenomenology lie. So the, the word description carries through all of these traditions and on into the like early modern phenomenologies. Um, so in brief, there, there is a certain continuity of the idea of description, both in, in the naive usual sense of description of phenomena presented to consciousness. Um, and um, the, the meta-dimensionality that you mentioned, um, you know, this, this might be referring to the, the two dimensions that I, I was talking about her 1950s work um, contributing to. And, and certainly, um, so she doesn't talk this way, but she does do this implicitly through what she calls horizon analysis. I don't, I don't know if this really <laughs> responds um, to the question really well, but um, I, I think that's, that's some stuff I, I could say in response. Thank you, sir. Um, another question for Professor Daipol is, um, okay, it's from Belgius Anaya. Do you think Conrad Marsh's uh, phenomenology is also contributing to the existentialist philosophy? And if yes, in what way, sir? Uh, well, there are some instances of reference to Conrad Martius um, that I'm familiar with. I'm sure there's a lot more as well, but um, Merleau-Ponty refers to her in, in his Phenomenology of Perception. Um, Paul Ricoeur refers to her, I'm not sure where exactly, but um, there is some direct uh, reference in a few places but more interesting, and, and this is actually really interesting, um, she's, she's coming on the scene in phenomenology uh, well before Martin Heidegger. And much of his work, many different aspects of his work um, is presaged by her work. The idea of um, focusing on the different kinds of being, um, not just Dasein, but Zodzein and Zienda and Zine and, and, and just all these different terms from her Zeinslehre. Um, I mean, from the, the larger, broader tradition of Zeinslehre and, um, and many other things about her style of philosophizing you can find in Martin Heidegger. Um, he, of course, it's well known that he um, ripped off Edith Stein um, when he finagled his, his way into um, getting Husserl's endorsement, of course, Husserl was into it, but, um, you know, Edith Stein put together the inner time consciousness phenomenology lectures with Husserl, and then Heidegger comes and takes the position and um, puts his name on it um, as part of the condition for um, the endorsement of, of his being in time. So it's possible, in fact, that, that Heidegger was, was ripping off Edith um, Hedvig Conrad Martius in more ways than one, but, um, but anyway, I mean, generally, yes, I think um, existential phenomenology is influenced. It's not totally clear um, in all the ways that it's influenced by the philosophy of Conrad Martius. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Daibel. And one last question from Ramil Rosette. In James Hart's HC, Ah, Henry, Henry Conrad Marchus's ontological phenomenology. He discussed some, if I may say, eschatological themes on expounding real ontology and real mythology. From this, can we also say that, like Edith Stein, Henry Conrad Martius is also leading towards using phenomenological method in Christian spirituality? There you go, sir. Yes, um, absolutely. 
um, she is, I mean, she collaborated with Edith Stein on like, for example, some translations of Alexander Poiré's work on, um, on Descartes and the Scholastics, on um, Jakob Boma. Um, and generally she was part of um, this, this kind of circle of work. Um, um, a, num a number of other early phenomenologists like Jean Herring and um, uh, Hildebrandt and uh, so many others were, were interested in bringing Aristotelian philosophy through um, Thomas Aquinas and, uh, and this kind of work. So you find these categories of, of you know, the supernatural or, or you know, um, what's beyond, what, what's sometimes called transnatural, she calls it transphysicia, transphysical potencies um, of being. Um, so th this is actually like a, a really broad tradition. And then you, you find it like in Eric Przewara's work, the Analogia Entis and Edith Stein, of course, in, in much the same way. So the answer, the response is affirmative, and it, it's a it's a, a rich field. So one could start looking into this. You know, there's a lot there. All right, thank you, Professor Dival, for your answers. Um, let's now go on to Edith Stein's phenomenology. Um, this question is also from Professor Dival. And I think it's addressed to Father Francis Pio. Um, how would you qualify Stein's atheism in the period immediately prior to her conversion? So I think Father responded already via chat box, but Father, can you please try to elaborate on it or would you like to uh, discuss it now? Yeah, perhaps reading it would just do us good. <laughs> All right, hello, sir. It is. Uh, Characterized based on my readings as quite natural in her teenage growth towards maturity. So as I have quoted, uh, I've cited Gabor Yao, he, she considers such avowed atheism as but indifference. Yeah. Indifference in the sense that um, perhaps she was bored by the services of the synagogue where her mother took her with her sisters. No. Uh, I think that happens to any religion also. But it was not an atheism that is a fixed attitude that can be called strictly, uh, in the uh, strict sense, atheism. No? So that I think it's just a passing kind of atheism, really. But it's quite serious in it, in a way, no? Because of her, if you see see it from the vantage point of view of uh, searching for truth. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in this topic, um, especially because, you know, since like Nietzsche, death of God and the secularization of, of the sciences, natural, of, of culture, of humanity, and of the sciences, naturalization, you know, um, phenomenology works against the natural attitude and what's called naturalism, but it um, for these early realist phenomenologists, it's also um, you know working against uh, this this naturalization. So you know the the experience of like being either atheist or indifferent is um, so pervasive. And when someone like Edith Stein has this Archimedean moment, this Ar Archimedean point of a, a sudden conversion from such a state, however it's qualified, to suddenly um, adopting the, the, the religion of Teresa of the cross, of, of Teresa of Jesus, um, you know, that, that's something that is potential for, for everyone, and, it, and it, it doesn't even necessarily have to be a conversion to Catholicism, although it, it is in her case, and it, it, it might generally be, um, and I'm, I'm interested in this possibility of a radical paradigm change or you know metaphysical restructuring mm. yeah actually if you if we try to go back to accounts about her life you know, it took a while a long while really um, for her to arrive at that point of conversion um, many years uh, were spent at being indifferent to Jewish practice of their faith no? 
So actually those circumstances, uh, um, which really triggered her mind you know, and her heart in her pursuit of what really is true, I think uh, they were contributory to that conversion. That's why I, I paid special attention uh, to characterizing those four circumstances because they were commingling and interconnecting to leading to that uh, significant point of conversion. Yes, it can be another faith actually, not necessarily Catholic. Huh? I, it so happened that in her case, you know, those circumstances were leading towards Catholic faith. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you have a second question there, sir, which I also responded to chat. Um, yeah, maybe I can voice it real quick and just talk about this because I think, well, I'm, I'm interested. Um, you know, there's a kind of patriarchy inherent uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. in the culture of, of, of Christianity. You know, God the Father, she, you know, she's a, a, a um, I mean, it's a different kind of patriarchy, perhaps, but it's, it's also at the, the root of, um, of the kind that's, you know, pro been yeah. problematic <laughs> for all time. Um, and, um, you know, she's, she's a daughter of, of Christ of, of, or bride of Christ. And, you know, so, so um, when you focus on, um, uh, is it Julian of yeah. Norwich? Yeah. You know, she, she thinks of God as also mother. So I'm just curious, like, you know, how that might be pulled over to Edith Stein in any way. Um, I smile about it because uh, when I defended my thesis about that, it was found very orthodox. <laughs> uh, because uh, in my theological reading of, of that uh, text by Juliet of Dorwich, her showings of divine love, um, it was not really about sex or gender. It was simply beyond it, okay? It was simply beyond it. Uh, the consideration of God as mother, as father, as sister, as brother, as spouse, as wife, or husband, simply go beyond um, gender and, uh, and sex. So it was near, not really an issue about uh, feminism, no? It was not a feminist agenda, I must say, no? according to the feminist agenda that uh, most uh, feminists have nowadays. Now, uh, I would say in the, uh, I don't know how, relating it with Edith Stein, um, I would say that uh, actually I tried to respond that about, about that adapted tradition, no? which, uh, what she did through her scholarly work shows us that, that truly, uh, she's at par with Husserl, no? I mean, even intellectually, or the inter, I don't know if she would have had a longer life, she would have had proven it more satisfactorily. And uh, it was an issue, life issue for her. And she struggled with it. And I must say, she is a victim of that too. But uh, she tried to go beyond it. And I believe her faith, her faith, Catholic faith eventually um, made her see beyond, beyond that adapted uh, tradition of patriarchy. But uh, she, was, she was going against it in a way, but in her own way, no? profound way, I must say. Yeah, and, and I don't, I don't want to, you know, I, you know, I don't want to take more time, but I, I do want to say one more thing. I mean, there's the, um, there's the, the issue of the transcendence, the radical transcendence of God being maybe beyond gender in a certain respect. But then when God relates to like the first man, Adam, and then institutes this, this line of, um, you know, from father to son kind of relations, 
it's it's cool that it can be somewhat like interrupted by the presence of female saints you know um so i mean i just wanted us to also consider this you know um earthly side of of the uh the the gender distinction yeah yeah no i don't know how to respond to that <laughs> it's much more complex than it seems but uh, at least at least in the war in the thoughts of stein that is not something that is something that is really considered i believe now in her struggle in her life in her writings and um uh, maybe it is left for us to continue with it um, uh, i'm not familiar if uh, maybe arendt writes about theology and you know the, these kinds of topics um um i don't think she writes about theology in the context of gender um certainly she her most theological work would be um her her doctoral work which was um uh love in the thought of saint augustine and this was when she was her interests were less political and more concerned about um um theology but then after after her i suppose like political awakening um her her interests uh changed very much so was she more focused on um the uh the matters at hand with with feminism and politics or um did she also frame it in the the broader picture of like you know the, the patriarchy being um inherent in you know um in a kind of metaphysical way no she actually didn't write about um uh f traditional um i would suppose feminist issues at all um, she has in her private correspondence um, and in like her interviews uh, comments about um, her own experiences as um, a woman in a you know largely male dominated field. Um, she was notably, I think, one of the first, no, the first woman to be invited to the Princeton University faculty, um, and so you know she she broke a lot of barriers in that sense. Um, but she didn't really think, um, you know, the, the idea of thinking about gender was not really central to her political thought um, or, or to her thought period. Um, some later scholars and, and the, her relationship with feminism has changed over the years. There was a period in time in the 1980s when many feminists considered her to be anti-feminist, uh, for example. But um, more recently, a lot of feminist thinkers um, have started to see a lot of promise in many of the themes that she writes. Um, and the, the example that I gave earlier, um, Kimberly Maslin talks about how a lot of her discussion on um, refugees in particular and the way that they are marginalized from society and from a kind of full way, way of living a human life um, is applicable to the state of women, which she in certain passages in passing mentions, although she doesn't again go into it very deeply. I, I think she didn't, based on her personal correspondence, I don't think she really knew what to make of the burgeoning feminist movement as she observed it during the time. Um, um, she was in general rather uh, suspicious of identity politics, um, but certainly um, there are a lot of themes in her work that I think have been useful for um, feminist philosophers that have come after her. And I know some Sorry. theology as well. It's okay. um, in in um, natality studies, which is not just a rent, but she's at the core of so much i mean she's just so, so influential you know um th there's that I'm, I'm sure there's other labor studies that i'm not familiar with as much but but natality studies like in, in the work of john Caputo and um who else like other um some female theologians you know, women theologians who who work on a rent will sometimes make it a little bit different than what Arendt herself would make it. Yeah, the thing about Arendt is that she doesn't write systematically. So um, scholars have described studying her work as pearl diving. So you have to go in and out of, you know, across her works, across her books, across her essays. 
um, to try to draw out her insights. And the thing about natality is that this is a theme that is there from the very beginning um, in her doctoral thesis all the way up to her very final writings uh, that she published um, towards the end of her life. And so her, I haven't looked at natality specifically in this way, but I do think that her ideas about natality do change um, throughout her career. Um, and so I think that when other scholars use her work, they're also using her work on natality um, from different parts of her life, right? From, so that the way she, that she talks about natality in one text might not be the same as the way that she, that she talks about natality in another text. Um, and there's like one of the debates, for example, that I, that I kind of waded into was um, whether Arendt is talking, the degree to which Arendt is literally talking about birth. And I, I won't bore you with the details, but the, the debate is, is, is essentially, is she talking about natality in a purely metaphorical way? Or is she actually talking about birth? And my position is that she's really talking about actual literal birth and not just metaphorical birth. <laughs> So yeah, there's a lot there. That's that's really interesting. If you're if you're so inclined uh, to get into, uh, I'm sorry to cut the discussion. So I think uh, due to time constraints, um, we is it all right if we proceed proceed with the next questions from the audience? All right, thank you. Um, so the next questions are addressed to Professor Rowe. Um, the first one is. How is Arendt different from the ways of phenomenological method of some existentialists like Sartre? Um, I think she's very different. Um, she, well, um, obviously there there are you know commonalities, um, but I think one of the key differences is that Arendt did not begin from the presumption that from the experience of an individual person, you might arrive at some kind of transcendent truth. Um, and what I think was important in her phenomenological approach or in the under underlying um, ontological beliefs that uh, of her method is, is really this phenomenology of plurality, as some scholars have described it, that every single individual's experience of the world is going to be different and every single individual person's experience, a perspective about the world is going to be different. And that was her starting point. So it was not this pres presumption that, okay, if I reflect on my experience, I'll therefore be able to, you know, make assumptions about what everybody else is experiencing at the same time, which, you know, certain readings of Sartre can, can lead to that kind of um, a presumption. Um, whereas she was really focused on this idea. I mean, despite the very Kantian influence, she was really trying to foreground this idea of of differences and uniqueness of, of individuals. And therefore, the kind of phenomenological method, if you want to call it that, that she ends up doing is very different from that tradition. Thank you, Professor Rowena. Um, one more question, although it's a bit general and not so related with Hannah Arendt's phenomenology, um, do we also have Filipino philosophers who focus their works on women's studies and kindly enlighten us? And also, may I ask for recommended readings for in women and phenomenology for starters or beginners? So this uh, question is from Nina Sumintak. Um, I'll just jump in. Um, there are a lot of um, women philosophers um, and women, you know, philosophers doing women's studies. Um, um, off the top of my head, I can think of um, Noel Leslie de, de la Cruz, um, uh, of La Salle, Dr. Gina Opiniano, of course, and so forth. Um, but um, there's a group that uh, runs monthly... Um, sessions, it's called Beyond the Ghetto. Um, and it's a group of women philosophers um, who run monthly sessions introducing women philosophers. Um, and, and these talks are, these are Zoom talks, they're open to the public and you know everybody's welcome to attend. And I think Dr. Opiniano also had a series of talks as well that she organized uh, introducing women philosophers. So um, those of you who are interested in learning about women philosophers and learning about Filipinos who's, who are doing work on women philosophers, are welcome to both of these series of talks. Um, I'll type the uh, the the name of the the 
the webinar series in the chat. All right, thank you for that, Professor Wena. Last question, um, I hope you, the three speakers could give us answers. This question is from Doc Jean Tan. May I ask the speakers to offer their thoughts on the relation or position of the three philosophers discussed tonight to the academy? I'm sorry, can you, can you say it one more time? Um, may I ask the speakers to offer their thoughts on the relation or position of the three philosophers discussed tonight to the academy? The, the last word you said was... Um, Discuss, yeah. Um, the, the Dr. Relation. Jean... Yeah, sorry, sir. Um, Dr. Jean Tan is asking the relationship or the position of the three philosophers discussed tonight to the academy. Oh, to the academy. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. yeah to the academy. Relationship to the academy. Um, I mean, I can I can start. I can say that um, with with Hedvig Conrad Martius, and and then. Um, and Professor Pio can also, I think, say about Edith Stein, it's, it's very similar. Um, it was very difficult for women. I, I tried to um, illustrate that um, in the sort of biographical background, the beginning of my talk, um, you know, with going into detail about like how it was um, in, in the high school environment. And then um, in order to get into college, what, what had she had to go through um, in, in Edith Stein's um, biography, Life in a Jewish Family, she also talks about how, um, how she learned from Conrad Martius's um, example with her experience with this Greek requirement. Um, so she was able to navigate that a, a, a little bit better. Um, but I mean, so th there's, there's that kind of relationship to the academy. And then um, in another sense, today, um, you know, th there's a lot of focus like this course and this this webinar series on on the the women phenomenologists um that's getting a lot of attention and you know that that's really great and and Paderborn University has this program um uh where they look at both like women in the history of of philosophy overall from ancient Pythagorean women so many of them um and uh, uh modern women philosophers who have, have written a great deal about philosophy, some of them tangentially connected or um, directly connected to um, the philosophers we have heard of, the male philosophers, and, and today. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of work being done to, to try to make the, the women voices um, more present. But it, it's always going to be a battle. I, I think patriarchy is the head vampire in the sense of like, um, you know, all the other xenophobias and racisms and such, you know, um, th those are those are there. But, um, you know, patriarchy <laughs> is, I like to think of it as the head vampire. You know, if you kill it, then all the half vampires might return to normal. <laughs> I would agree with this, sir, Daiba. And um, I'm sure you must have gleaned through my presentation earlier how complex and difficult it was for Edith Stein. No? And yet, despite all those, uh, those ads, she tried to excel. No? And for that, she was also duly acknowledged, others described the barriers of created but by patriarchy could not be totally eradicated. No? So, but in their own way, they have contributed a lot, I believe, no? to, uh, to, the, to, that, to such direction that nowadays, if you, if you see it, there's a lot much more significant um, improvement no? in terms of that, in terms of that. Um, so as for Arendt, she had her, um, 
she worked in the academy throughout her life. So, I mean, when she moved to the United States, um, uh, she would always, um, you know, be in, well, she worked at New School for a long time. Um, but she refused to have a full-time position um, because she wanted the agility to be able to, um, well, she did, basically, she, she did, she, you know, she, she was a little bit, uh, she she wanted more free time to be able to write, uh, to be able to 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 do other kinds of writing, um, and not be weighed down by all of the, um, you know, university class preparation and all of that. But she was always, um, and I think that this this again reflects her desire to not be entrenched into the academy and to always be in touch with what was going on, um, out, around her, um, in the more political sense. Yeah, can I can I uh, also say in connection to to that that um, you know I'd like to be optimistic that things are getting better, but um, it's it's not necessarily true. And and part of this might just be like financial and and um, you know socioeconomic like things. But the, but there's you know there's sexism built into the socioeconomic mechanisms in society still as much as we try to you know make there be success and progress for things um you know things just get the evil just shifts into other you know dark corners and interstices that you know are just not totally visible um for what we can do you know and and so like um women philosophers who i know and um and I'm I'm married to one. <laughs> My wife's a professor of philosophy, and you know, I I see very clearly that um, things are not necessarily getting better, but they're also not necessarily getting better for anyone. Like um, uh, full tenure ships, tenure positions um, are very few in relation to all the the difficulties of of um, adjunct work here in, in the US and around the world, I'm sure. And, um, you know, a, a rent taking a part-time position in order to like have leave time and, you know, and just not be destroyed by the academy is um, just one example of, of things being not so different today <laughs> and maybe even worse today. So not to leave it on a pessimistic note, but, you know, something to, something to consider. <laughs> Thank you so much to our speakers for clarifying and answering all of our questions. May I now call on Ramil, Mr. Ramil Rosette, one of my classmates in the Women and Phenomenology class and our commentator for tonight for his contribution to the discussions we had. Um, thank you for that, Ms. Edel. And before I give my commentary, I would like to express my gratitude to all our speakers who committed themselves to be present. And we know for a fact that even though we are on different time zones, you committed to our invitation. And it, indeed, it has been our honor to hear your profound thoughts on phenomenology of the philosophers we are discussing at hand. Henry, Hedwig Conrad Marshus, and St. Edith Stein, and Hannah Arendt were not just women who did philosophy like men of their times. Instead, they were women who, despite the cultural, political, and historical circumstances that disfavored women, were able to illumine us with their thoughts and particular philosophical contributions. Beyond following users' phenomenology, they were able to phenomenologize on their own different fields. This moment, what we have just witnessed, is the tireless endeavors of women to strive towards the truth. If there's something that phenomenology would tell us, particularly at this moment, that would be to look at things more than how they immediately appear to the senses. This movement would help one to reflect on how one sees the world and appreciate the world as such. This movement brings to a reflective inquiry an element that is fundamental in phenomenology. This inquiry calls one to look at things not only from a scientific and calculative perspective, 
but also to take into account one's own experience of reality. The three philosophers faithfully express this inquiry as they do phenomenology. Truly, their phenomenologies are an attempt to attend to what is fully given. Um, after listening, my question is, what do these philosophers have in common? From where can we consider them similar? Um, they were able to venture into different perspectives regarding different fields. Um, Professor Daibal, Father Rayo, and Professor Rowe were able to give salient points regarding their particular philosophies. And essentially, these philosophers have their own brands of phenomenology. And so, time and again, we ask the question, what do these philosophers have in common? From where can we consider them similar? My take is that daily human experiences are indeed significant in making meaning. Natural sciences give data in order for man to understand the world. Phenomenology aids man in understanding the meaning of his world. Taking cues from the philosophy of Conrad Marshus, there's always an excess of the appearing. Every, every experience is always already exceeding. And this excess takes various forms. The excess on the side of the noesis, that is the consciousness intentionality, um, is the excess of world as the horizon of the knowable and already known, and which horizon is pre-thematically operative in all our experiences. Quoted from James, Hart book, James Hart's book, um, Hedwig Conrad Marshus's um, Ontological Phenomenology. He ob the object has its own power to disclose itself. That is, the thing truly raises itself in order to be fully given. Thus, it is something that perennially unfolds to us, the thinking conscious subject. A spiritual attitude is the lens through which this excess can be appropriately examined. And this is indeed significant in Conrad Marsh's phenomenology. Here, she shows how, in a spiritual attitude, one sees more than he properly can see. Along with what is properly seen, the world or, press, or milieu is present, quoted from the same book. This attitude enables us to see things not just in a perspective, but rather to really see things as substantial things. When the spiritual attitude is shut down, we do not perceive the other side or substantiality or field or perception or the environment that contributes to the substantiality of things. As echoed from Professor Dybel's speech a while ago. Moreover, what Conrad Marshes emphasized is the possibility of man to be spiritually blind in seeing the realm of essence intuition. Eventually, given to us is the claim that we really need to have a renewed perspective of seeing nature, not just as natural science would perceive it. Instead, one needs to recognize that the excess of the appearing is ever present in all things. As Conrad Marshus claims that the excess takes various forms, so is the unfolding of truth for it each time. As Father Pio said a while ago, Due to its gradual unfolding, truth manifested to Edith Stein in many faces, corresponding to the stages she was in her journey. Likewise, it was in the person of Edith Stein do we see a woman explicitly striving towards the attainment of truth. This endeavor, to say, is indeed a lifelong journey. From youth to her cloistered life, she regarded daily experiences complementary with what is given in natural science to arrive to a more profound understanding of the world and its meaning. In Conrad Marshus, we see phenomenology arriving at the understanding of nature in relation to natural sciences. Here, we see Edith Stein doing phenomenology to arrive to the truth, particularly the truth about the human personhood. This endeavor convinced her 
as I quote from Father Pio, of the inextinguishable uniqueness of the human person who lives at the same time in the state of spiritual interconnectedness with the rest of reality. St. Edith Stein's phenomenological method was not confined to understanding the reality of human personhood solely. Her method was very evident also as she wrote works that are spiritual and theological. Here, we see how phenomenological method gives meaning to particular experiences of man, not just in a philosophical milieu, but extending beyond it as long as it seeks the same truth. This truth for Edith Stein is ultimately found in the church. Finally, we see how for Edith Stein phenomenology, she arrives to understand that the truth pursued throughout her life is not an idea nor an abstraction but rather a person whom one should encounter, whom one should love. The same aspiration towards the truth and meaning in doing phenomenology is present in the philosophy of Hannah Arendt. She follows phenomenology's return to the things themselves, aiming to make available the objective structures and characteristics of man's political life. With this, she did not merely do phenomenology but more so initiates a method of doing political phenomenology. Elaborated in this method is how the experiential characteristics of human life in the context of an objective characteristic of a political being in the world is an unequivocal, unequivocal mode of human experience. As Professor Azada Palacios elaborated to us a while ago, Arendt has a very unique approach in doing phenomenology. Um, my take is that the influence of the descriptive element of phenomenology is highly influential, as she described and elaborated her ideas human, using human experiences. And when we speak of human experiences as a foundation of theorizing, we don't solely speak of um, Hannah Arendt's own idea, but through the concept of visiting, we may better understand the world. This experiential reference in her life and social context surrounding her became indeed a rich ground for her in theorizing. Now we see Arendt's philosophy, an ever-renewed understanding of the nature of the political realm, not just in her times, but so also on our own, through a thorough investigation using a phenomenolo phenomenological perspective. We should then realize that banality lies when man fails to use reason and should submit to the traditional social and cultural blind obedience. By highlighting the human experience of being in the world, both of her own and others, we understand how human activity should ultimately speak of man's freedom in this world of appearances. To conclude, Henry Conrad Marshus Edith Stein and Hannah Arendt did phenomenology not only to discover the structures of our consciousness as we experience reality, but rather to manifest a meaningful objective structure of our everyday being in the world. This enables us then to recognize the excess in every appearing. Hence, we arrive to be lifelong seekers of the truth in order for us to constantly have a renewed understanding of the meaning of our world. After hearing the thoughts of Professor Daibal, Father Rayo, and Professor Azada Palacios, we recognize, appreciate, and have a renewed understanding of an infamous idiom. Truly, there's something more than what meets the eye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Rosetta. Let us now move on to the awarding of certificates to our lecturers for their insightful discussions and generous sharing of their time to be with us tonight. Okay. Um, so the certificate of appreciation is presented to Professor Randolph J. Dybal, PhD candidate for sharing his valuable insights as a resource speaker in the Women and Phenomenology International webinar entitled Henry Conrad March's 
phenomenology given this 29th of April 2021 at the University of Santo Tomas, Manila, Philippines, signed by Ms. Gina A. Opiniano, PhD, and Associate Professor Jovito V. Carino, PhD. So the same certificate goes to Professor Wena Asado Palacios and Father Francis Payo for their enriching and enlightening lectures. Thank you once again to our speakers. We would also like to extend our gratitude to Dr. Jovito Carino and Dr. Flor Deliz Altes Albella for gracing this webinar, to Dr. Gina Opiniano for encouraging the class to hold this event and for being so hands-on with guiding us to make this a reality. Thank you to Sir Joselito Zulueta and the Varsitarian for generously accommodating us. And lastly, thank you to everyone for attending and participating. We hope that you gain valuable insights through the lectures. So for, for those who are interested in an e-certificate, kindly fill out the evaluation form. Uh, the link is currently in the chat box. Just try to fill it in. Okay, so before we close the program, is it all right if I encourage everyone to turn on their cameras for a short photo opportunity? <laughs> all right, so, Sir Rick Edel, may I ask you to take charge of the photo? Of Thank you. Okay, so, good day, everyone. So, may I invite uh, everyone to turn on their cameras for a short photo of? Then at the count of three, let us uh, smile. Are you ready? One, two, three, smile. Again, one, two, three, smile. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. So to conclude our program, may I call on our class president, Mr. Blaise Ringmore for the closing remarks. Good evening everyone. Uh, in his letter to women, John Paul II, who was also known as Carol Wojtyla in the philosophical realm, observed that very little of women's achievements in history can be registered by the science of history. But even though time may have buried the documentary evidence of those achievements, their beneficent influence can be felt as a force which has shaped the lives of successive generations right up to our own. Without a doubt, the three women that our respected speakers talk about this evening, Hedwig Conrad Marshus, Edith Stein, and Hannah Arendt, are only few of the many women who contributed in the shaping of our generation. Nevertheless, their humble contributions are valuable even up to this point. Conrad Marshus stood for a real ontology that centers on the flourishing of being through her concept of space. Stein fought for empathy in phenomenological sense as she witnessed the evil of her own time, while Arendt stood against fascism and various political oppressions. Indeed, these three women are not simply great philosophers. Above all, they are great exemplar women whose noble contributions to the world must never be left forgotten. On behalf of Dr. Gina Openiano and my classmates in the graduate course, Women and Phenomenology, we wish to thank everyone who supported this international webinar particularly our most valued plenary speakers, Dr. Randy, Dr. Rowe, and Father Francis, who in their kindness and generosity, dedicated their time to share their knowledge in this conference. We also want to extend our sincerest gratitude to Professor Michael Anthony Vasco, our Dean of Studies, and Associate Professor uh, Jovito V. Carino, the Program Lead of Philosophy in UST Graduate School. A special thanks as well goes to the Versitarian through Sir Lito Zulueta for helping us with the technicalities in preparation and in the entire duration of this webinar. And of course, to all of you who attended this conference, we hope that we all have learned a treasurable knowledge in this webinar. 
Apologies for whatever lapses we may have overlooked. We ask for your kind understanding and we hope to see you again. Once again, good evening and may God bless us all. Thank you, Blaze. Now I invite everyone to, um, to conclude the event. Let's listen to the USD hymn. Thank you, everyone, for your participation and support. Thank you, Adele. I think that, that, that video made all of us miss being on <laughs> campus. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank Good night. Good uh, night. Thank you. Thank you, Mom Jun. Thank you. Salamat po. Thank you. Thank you. Salamat po. po. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you po. Thank you po. Thank you so Good much. Night. Good night. Naka-record po yata. <laughs>